Today's episode of Kevin Pollock's Chat Show is brought to you by Audible. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash kpcs to download your free audiobook. Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How are you? It's so nice for you to join us today on a very exciting day for here, uh, those of us that work on this show. Because we, you know, this show uh, interview number 121. And while we've had some amazing guests, we've had a couple of turds. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Which would the turds be for you, Sammy? Oh, that's such a great <laughs> question. <laughs> Why? Why would I do that? Why now, would you do We've that? had 120, 120 amazing guests prior to this one, but today is especially exciting for uh, most of us because we are not just uh, fans, we're like silly, obnoxious. It's John motherfucking Landis, everybody. There super we fans. have Sorry. We're super fans. <laughs> no, that's how you, that's how you <laughs> yeah. put it. That's, by the way, that's now on uh, the cover of the, uh, the story. John motherfucking Lance. John motherfucking that, Lance. That's actually what is on the uh, show today. Yeah, there was it was a cover of Variety right. yesterday. Fantastic. Uh, it's Friday, and now it's uh, now it's being said out loud. Uh, yeah, pretty uh, pretty damn excited. Uh, we have a little bit of business to get out of the way first, which is you saw the Audible.com thing there. You, you see, uh, we have ourselves a little sponsor there this week in the Audible.com. Those fine folks said, "Yeah, sure, we'll pony up seven dollars." Doesn't work when we laugh. Does not work when we laugh. You're not buffering. <laughs> we did the buffering gag because you're watching on your computer. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we now have uh, the audible.com folks, and they have some sort of copy I'm supposed to read, don't they, uh, Kenneth? Dr. Cheneth? Dr. Chenoweth? See, all those I'm people who turned in to see me are gone now. Yeah, yeah, they're gone. They're history. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm here to tell you that Audible has the largest selection of digital audiobooks available for download. Over 85,000 titles. I've read all of them. What the hell? Audible has the best narrators interpreting books by top authors. My recommended book of this week to you, by the way, I have three. Uh, An Object of Beauty by Steve Martin. Fan-fucking-tastic. 2030 by Albert Brooks. I think you see a little pattern here, my heroes. And then this knucklehead, Adam Mansbach, wrote Go to Go the... F to Sleep, uh, as read by Sam L. Jackson. Hmm. Go the F to Sleep. Uh, go to audiblepodcast.com backslash KPCS to download your free book. That's right. They were kind enough to not only sponsor the show, but offer up a free book to you, the fans of the show. If you're uh, catching us up on iTunes the day after, you're, you're, you're listening at the gym, don't forget that some um, Audible podcast. Go back to that, Kenny, so I can read it again correctly, because you know I'm, I have no memory. Audiblepodcast.com backslash KPCS uh, to get yourself a free book from the fine folks at Audible. So thank you, you fine folks, you. Uh, Sammy. Yeah? What the hell? What the hell, man? Yeah, how's it going? Good. How was your week? All right. Excellent. Uneventful. Nothing? I got nothing. Nothing? Nope. You have nothing? I have nothing. What happened? The Cubs lose every game? Uh, actually, they won their first three game, uh, uh, three games in a row of the season this they, past week. They swept did they the... win their first three games in a row? Yes, they did. You they know, I guess today was born in the Illinois. I'm sorry? In the Illinois, our first our guest today. Our guest was born, born there. in Chicago. No yeah, not raised there, I believe. But uh, was born in the Chicago area. Do you know who else was born in the Chicago area? Please, give me at least six. This guy. Well, you were. You know that, don't you? <laughs> yes, of course. Come on! I do. Get your I shit together, Pollock. I thought you were going to give me uh, Mamet, somebody. Oh, I'm sure. Gary Sinise? To block. To block. Yeah. yeah. Hmm, he he should care more about the Republican nature Chicago of things. born in Chicago that I'm... Let me Who are you thinking about? Um, Harold Ramis? Yes. Uh, what? Uh, I think our guest today worked with Harold Ramis. Perhaps he can shine a little light on your crush of uh, 80s Ramis. All things 80, 80s Ramis. 
Late seventies, I think. Late seventies into early eighties. Yeah, ninety two. Yeah, yeah. We didn't discuss this. All the way to ninety two. Yes. Um, uh, Jamie, one of our fans, um, the Binions, have sent in a couple of videos. We've shown two. <laughs> the last one demonstrated Sam's inability to slide into first base. I don't I don't mm. You don't remember that? Uh, vaguely. Vaguely. Uh, it's a blackout. There's a third video. Oh God. Made by a fan. The These Binion. kids are just the attention Bin hogs. The now. Binion family. I don't. I don't. I, you can't point anything at the kids. I think the kids are trained. And I think. <laughs> I think trained? Ter Terry, Father Binion, in this case, if there are any fingers to be pointed, he it's, has rehearsed the hell yeah. out of these kids. Yeah. All right. We had a little technical difficulty last week with our fine guest Michael McCain. We're un unable to uh, include this, but here it is, the new KPCS tribute band oh, video God. from the Binions. Roll now. Hello, welcome to Kevin Pollock's chat show. I am, as always, chat show. We have a great show for you. I am really excited. We have the head writer from our favorite podcast, Jamie Fox. Check this out. Hello, my name is Michaela. Nice smile, by the way. Thanks. Here are some photos that we have for Jamie Foxx. I'm not really sure why this is here. I think she dated Joe Pesci. And I will ask her about her Disney collection. She likes Disney almost as much as I do. Oh, and check this out. Arby's. Jamie Foxx might be the biggest Arby's fan on the planet. And I even made her a special gift. A new keychain. But there is something that she loves more than Arby's. 1980s Harold Ramis. Her dream guy. We have tried our best to make her feel at home. says Jamie Foxx just arrived and he is in our green room. What? What do you mean he? Who is this guy? I think he's a singer and an actor. He's not the Jamie Foxx we thought. Do you still want to talk to him? No, I don't know him. I wanted the real Jamie Foxx. Well, I think he's talented. Yeah, well, he sounds like a hack. Make him leave. As you can see, we're not ready. And as always, get out of my face. They did a buffering gag at the end. But they didn't announce that it was a buffering gag. <laughs> they just or was it, it. was it a genuine buffering? Or was it our buffering? Oh, God, who knows. Jamie, wow. you seem a little creeped out now. Huh? I mean, this is just from watching the show. You would know all these things about me, that I love Arby's, Disney, and Harold Ramis. So it's not that, uh -huh. it's not that much of a secret. So you don't feel like you have a stalker in the Binion family. Uh, Sam, a little pressure off you? I'm going to call child services. Uh huh. Uh, Why would you do that? Well, I don't think either of those children really wanted to be there. It's more like, come on, honey, we gotta record this video. But, Daddy, we wanna go out and, to Friendlies and get a fribble. No. Friendlies gonna, for a fribble? Isn't that where you go for that? We're getting applause in the next room, yeah. <laughs> it must be. And he says, no. It's like a honey. whole new world for me. Barbies, <laughs> <laughs> Friendlies, fribbles, <laughs> buffering. I don't even know what the fuck that is. <laughs> <laughs> the show is educational, my friend. Uh, Michael McKean was here last week. And Michael McKean was here. We had actual guests. <laughs> yeah, he's a get. Um, all right, well, thank you to the Binion family, I think. And now it's time... <laughs> no, we love them. Now it's time for Ask Kevin. If only we had a graphic that could accompany this... Ask Kevin. What the fuck? This one from Joseph Calhoun. This is actually an Ask Jamie, Ask Sam. What? Although you may chime in if you so desire. Mm -hmm. That's right, I'm telling you what to do on your show. Who is your favorite Albert Brooks voice? We did this last week. Simpsons character. We had a... Uh, 
Well, yeah. you should tell me these things. Well, I don't know why you want it rehearsal. Uh, Alvin Brooks voice <laughs> Simpsons character Hank Scorpio or Russ Cargill. Personally, I prefer Hank Scorpio. So, uh, and then he quotes Hank Scorpio as saying, you ever see a man <laughs> give away a shoe? Yes, once. All right, so uh, uh, Jamie. I never heard someone do Albert. Oh, please, I could go on for four hours. You ready for this? Our, our, our guest today directed, uh, uh, that's right, directed Albert in, in the top portion there. Yes, I just remember that. Uh, so you have a, a favorite, is, is it uh, Russ Cargill or um, Hank Scorpio? It is actually uh, Jacques from season one in the bowling episode yeah. where he seduces Marge. If only there were someone on our staff who if, could impersonate. If only there were someone who would do the outtake that's not even fully animated that you can watch in the extras of the season one DVD. How might that go? It would be something like, oh, Marge, I'm going to take this bottle of champagne and I'm going to break it open on the side of the table. <laughs> I'm going to break it open on the side of the table in a way that will not produce any sharp edges. It's a very masculine, special way of... Ah! I'm bleeding, Marge! Give me a towel! Or words to that effect. But uh, you should find that if you have it on the DVD and enjoy it. Because he does it better than I do. The character's name is Jacques. And so, to hell there with Cargill and Scorpio. Well, well Scorpio. I do love Hank. I think Scorpio is a great character. He goes to, sends Homer to the Hammock District. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, there you have it. There's their answer. Uh, this one from Smell My Feet. Kevin, if you were to suffer some bizarre form of stroke and be struck forever speaking with the voice of, and mannerism of one of your impressions, which would you prefer? Also, Jamie, with which impression would you prefer to live? I think we know you would prefer none of them. You hate when I do the voices. Yes, yeah, sometimes you um, <laughs> ask me questions in different voices, and I refuse to answer until you speak in your real voice. Yeah. What, what voice does he use during sex? <laughs> a grunting old, I think a grunting old Jew is what we're yes. looking for. No, I would love to, like, the, the whole concept of being in bed, making love to your husband, and suddenly you hear Albert Brooks. <laughs> Listen, what are you doing? Get off me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny in concept, but in the actual moment of sex, it's, it's a horrible idea. Uh, yeah, so I don't do voices around the house anymore because I was, uh, I was met with and so, uh, you but buffers? yeah, pretty much, she buffers me. So if I were to, uh, if I were to get locked into a voice, it'd be Albert Brooks is a good choice, or Alan Arkin, or or, uh, or uh, Walter. I'm going to say Brooks for you because you have often said that when you are doing Albert Brooks, you th are funnier and sharper, and funnier. Yeah. When I think as Albert Brooks, right. seriously, I'm going to go lie down. Is it me? Am I nauseous? I don't know. I'm going to read the next one. Question from Chris Carosi, because that's a name. Dear Kevin. You and your guests often talk about rehearsals, do we, Chris? Mostly uh, how they seem detrimental to those involved. I was wondering if you might share your best, strangest rehearsal story or maybe the strangest one you've heard. Thanks, love the show. There you have it from Chris. Um, strangest moment of rehearsal, uh, a few good men. First, uh, the director, Rob Reiner, uh, rehearsed for a week with just uh, Tom Cruise, Demi Moore, and myself. I dropped those names, and now I've picked them up. Um, and so we rehearsed for a week. And Rob, because he was an actor, ends up sort of giving what is referred to by actors as a line reading, which one never wants from a director, which is the worst version as a director to say, no, no, not like that, like this, and then tell you how to do it. No actor wants that. And as a director, you don't want to alienate the children in the sandbox too terribly by telling them how to do their jobs. But Rob is so uh, passionate and emotion and, and, and gets caught up in it that he says, you know the thing where you grab the thing and you grab the bat and you say, I, I think better with the bat. And you're doing this with your hands. So he ends up kind of acting it out without really meaning, don't do it your way, you idiot, do it mine. But he ends up giving these so-called line readings. So after a week of that, we're all used to it and we're loving it, we're having a great time. Jack Nicholson arrives to rehearse. And the moment comes for Jack's first, first time rehearsing the moment on the stand, the soliloquy in the courtroom. You need me on that wall. You want me on that wall. And the whole thing, right? And it's long, and it's lengthy, and it goes on. And at the end of which, Tom, <laughs> to me and I, just kind of move back a foot waiting for Rob to go into his. And sure enough, Rob goes into his, yeah, you know when you get to the thing and you're saying, eh, and he just acts out the whole scene again. To which Nicholson replies, yes, well, I guess I'm not there yet. 
ding, 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 ding. That's the sound of a pin dropping and hitting the... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that was uh, fantastic, uh, fantastically awkward, as, uh, as that sort of thing gets. And then um, went on to, uh, to wonderful other days of rehearsal, but oh boy. Uh, and now it's time for the Larry King game. You know, we tried to prep our guests today about the, about the show, what to look forward to, what might come your way. Uh, and we did not get to the Larry King game, so I'm going to do my uh -oh. best while announcing that Joshua Wade from Atlantic, jo Atlanta, Georgia is our winner of a T-shirt. Joshua, if you've not, email us quickly at contact at .com to tell us your shirt size and your address, and we will send you off a Kevin Pollock's Chat Show T-shirt. Our guest, of course, receiving one in his gift bag today. Um, the, the premise here, in order to win, bad Larry King impression. All the guests at the end of the show have given their Larry King game. Uh, I'm, I'm letting our guest now know that, and he's waving it off, saying it's not going to happen. Bad Larry King impression, don't want a good one, not interested, want a bad one, which I will demonstrate. And then, at that moment where Larry shares something about himself that nobody really wants to know, one of those King's things that nobody cares about or wants to know, and then go to the phone, the name of the city is funny sounding, it's, it's going to help. Here's an example, this one brought to you by Rollback from Atlanta, Georgia, Kenny? Uh, Joshua Wade. All right, <clears throat> this is Larry King. I just want to mention that my enema this morning was the second most arousing experience of my life. The first being the swinger party I crashed with Charles Nelson Riley and Phyllis Diller back in the 70s. Hornytown, North Carolina, you're on the air. And that's your winner this week of the Larry King game. Now, on to important business. We have, as we mentioned at the top of the show, a very special guest, uh, not just because of uh, uh, fame and fortune and a ridiculous uh, body of work, but because we are uh, uh, Uber fans and uh, have mentioned so uh, over these last couple of years uh, on, on several occasions. Something will come up, a reference, one of which was a recent trip to see the, uh, the 8 millimeter. No. Super 8. Thank you. Super 8. Hey. Very different movies. They're totally different very, movies. Very, a lot very less S&M in, in Super 8 yeah. <laughs> than 8 millimeter. But not absent. But not. <laughs> but Certainly not, not from the absent. audience. <laughs> no. So yeah. Jamie and I go to the AMC at the Century City, where we like to go because you get the reserved seats now. Yes, and I'm a Stubbs member. Yeah, and you're also <laughs> all about the Stubbs. So we got our reserved seats, and for the first time ever in my theater-going experience in my life, we show up, and they have not done the clean sweep of the theater. And so there are people's popcorns and boxes and things Probably left at the seats, selling. and we're like, what the? Is Which this is a an problem episode? because just of the, Mega reserves, Man? What happened the reserve seating. That's, the, that's why it's a problem. That's why it was an issue. We yes. were saying I have to sit in someone else's filth because I, this is my reserve seat. So we sit down in our seats, and before the uh, lens flares begin, I believe there were 19 in the film, before the lens flares begin as the homage to 70s filmmaking, I guess, uh, seven, eight rows down in front of us, in walks today's guest, and friend who attempts to sit in his seat and has to literally, I think, pick up a box and move a thing over also and give one of these before he can sit down. <laughs> to which Jamie yells out, see you next Wednesday, which didn't really <laughs> cause anything to happen. No head turn, nothing. Just I tried. <clears throat> um, also, there was a Twilight pr a trailer and I screamed, you call those werewolf effects? <laughs> That's right, uh, I she did. I think she did. Agree. We tried everything to get his attention, <laughs> nothing worked. Nothing. But then you went home and wrote a little... Uh, well, yeah. AMC then sent me a... Um, Questionnaire. Yes, a survey. I love taking my surveys. And they asked, you know, how was your experience? And I told them everything about how the theater was filthy. I let an usher know. And then at the end of it, I said, and I kid you not, uh, fi uh, filmmaker John Landis had to pick up somebody else's trash so he could sit in the seat. And yeah. I hope you're embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> We love that. So we told that story. And now, uh, don't you know? And they're still laughing. Yeah. <laughs> they're still throwing back uh, the laughter. Uh, thrilled beyond belief. Uh, John Lannis, thank you so much for joining us today. Honest to goodness. Thank you. Uh, so let's start with your experience that day, other than the trash being in the... Uh, how did you enjoy the 19 lens flares? And the, the... I thought the... I enjoyed... Uh, I thought Elle Fanning was great. Yes. Um, the movie was... Most people like it more than me because I kept seeing like, that's Spielberg, that's Joe Dante, yeah. that's Joe Dante, that's Steven Spielberg. It was kind of odd. It's my generation that includes, he's older than me, but people like Spielberg and Marty and Francis Coppola and De Palma and Scorsese, you know, all those guys, all those guys. They really are the first generation that grew up with movies. Right. So they're the first 
bunch of directors who made movies influenced by movies. Right. The other guys, you know, the first 60 years of the business, they were it. inventing the language, you right. know. Um, and then it gets to, you know, the postmodern stuff that, like, you know, Joe Dante and myself and, you know, people are doing. And then you get, like, uh, Tarantino, who now is making films that look like, to me, they look like like essays for college. I mean, they're interesting. I when I saw um, what the hell is it called? Uh, Kill Bill. I started recognizing cues from like Italian movies. Going, can you do that? You know, it's like, wait a minute. I think he's brilliant, but still, he he's making these movies about movies. Right. And then with this one, it was especially weird because this guy's making movies about movies that my generation made. Right. It's like, I know Joe Dante. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, I thought parts of it were great. You slept in the same house as Spielberg. <laughs> Once. <laughs> yeah. But, um, actually twice. But, um, I don't know. I liked, I thought it was well made. I didn't like, I, I didn't like, you know when the kid was holding the thing at the end and the necklace, his mom's necklace? I, I turned to the person I was with and said, let it go. <laughs> let it go. Yeah. You know, it was like, please. It yeah. really, it's beautifully made. But you talk about the flares. Yeah. Those are those Spielberg homages. And what was wonderful about that to me is Abrams, he's a gifted guy. Oh, I don't boy. want to knock him. But at the beginning of the movie, he had all these flares in the lens with no light source. <laughs> which I thought was their animating flares in the lens. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> the movie annoyed me. But I think uh, it's not a bad movie. Yeah. I mean, it's not a movie like most of the movies I see where, like, <clears throat> but I, you know, I enjoyed it. It was just a very strange experience. What was the last great film you remember seeing? That's not fair. Yeah, it isn't. I know it isn't. I haven't seen a great film. You know what film I thought was great? You're going to think this is really weird. No. Um, the Swedish Let the Right One In. Oh, yes. Everyone who saw it great was film. great. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> was like, great thought, film. Although it was odd, there's a scene in it that's like lifted from a picture I made with Rickles called Innocent Blood. You remember when Don burst into flame in the hospital? From the, it was like, hey, wait, can they do that? Oh, yeah, it's Sweden. They're not... <laughs> But anyway, but it's like, I love that movie. Yeah. I really love that. I mean, that was, but I have to think, that's not fair, because a lot of documentaries have made big impressions on me and stuff, but I haven't. I, I just have, started watching the one on Bobby Fischer that everyone was raving about. Have you seen that one yet? I haven't seen yet? it yet. My it? daughter loved it. Right. Yeah. That's a happy guy. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, let's jump in uh, any which way. Uh, I, I want to talk first, if you don't I, mind. Wait, I, you, sure. You were, I have to tell you a good story. Oh, really? Just, uh, I had, uh, I've told this story many times, but it was, <laughs> anytime I can, I will. I had a, uh, a building, a little b bungalow at Universal for like 24 years or something. And uh, until the tour came and <laughs> ate it. They literally, the tour, the tour when I started at Universal, you know, when I first went to Universal, where the Sheraton is, the yeah. Sheraton, it was the Gladiator School from Spartacus. Oh, my God. And as the tour came down the hill, it was like the blob. It was like, <laughs> they got wardrobe! You know, it was like it was coming down the hill. And it finally swallowed up me, too. And I said, okay, I'm out of here. But um, 24 years, though. Yeah, and by the grace of Lou Wasserman. Because when I went in the television business only because some accountant in Osaka, when, when they sold MCA to the Japanese, some guy went, why are we paying his overhead? And I got a call. Why, why are you, who, justify, I, oh, I'm doing television now. <laughs> you are? Yeah. But I did Dream On and started doing TV just to keep my... So a call from Osaka is the reason you did Dream On. I, absolutely. <laughs> I love, I love that bungalow. I really did. Anyway, I think now it's, you, they, when you wait in line for Jurassic Park, that's where it was. That's where your office. But down the down the road, Alfred Hitchcock had a bungalow, you and sure? I used to have lunch with him every other week for about three years. Jesus. And yeah, that's it was like having lunch with Jesus. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, although a hell of a lot funnier than Jesus. <laughs> well, but he was, he, you know, it really was extraordinary for me. But I, but a, he was a very funny person, and. <laughs> He, used, he was very current. He, he used to see, he had a little screening room in his bungalow, and every day, he'd come in every day at 9, and I think at 10.30, he'd see a movie. Really? A current movie. He saw everything. And, um, and then you would discuss it at lunch? Sometimes. And, but uh, the story concerned a uh, filmmaker, I won't mention his name, but a movie came out called Dress to Kill. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Wonder. Hitch... 
did not like the movie. He 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 was offended by it. Not he. He was offended by the obvious references to Hitchcock, and clearly it's a love letter to Hitchcock and the, and the Palmas, you know, making this Hitch, Hitchcockian movie. But Hitch was terribly upset by the fact that all the reviews said Hitchcockian, and the ad said, in quotes, Hitchcockian, and it really pissed him off. Right. He was terribly upset about it, he didn't like the movie, and he was kind of ranting about it. And I wasn't a big fan of the movie or De Palma, but... I found myself having to defend the director because Mr. Wow. Hitchcock was saying, you know, he was stealing from him and stuff. And I said, I'm sorry, Hitch. It took me two years to call him Hitch. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, I, you know, Hitch, it, it, he's not stealing from you. It's an homage. Right. And without hesitation, he said, you mean fromage? <laughs> <laughs> he was calling it cheese, Kenny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was just all like, I just wanted to go, excuse me, I want to go call the Palma. But I didn't. I didn't. And it's years later, so there you go. So he did have a hell of a sense of humor oh, because no, he the was, Fromage joke is pretty good. He was also extremely vulgar. Well, thank goodness. <laughs> and could always get a real shock out of me, always shock me by what, saying something outrageous. What is it about our heroes when they curse? It's peculiarly, if not uniquely, hilarious Rather than being, oh, of course they curse also, you know. Like no, the rest he, well, of he's Alfred Hitchcock. He's like, he's... He's, Ma he's Mount Rushmore, right? Yeah, he's it. iconic figure. And the first time I met him, he used an expression I'd never heard before, but I was so shocked. He referred to a gay woman as a muff diver. <laughs> and I, I was like, I was, you know, <laughs> because it was Alfred Hitchcock. I was like, what? Did you just do a Tex Avery move with your glasses? <laughs> yeah. I think you did. I met Tex Avery. Well, finish cock, catch cock no, first, when please. I was, when I was, when finish I cock. Was, <laughs> finish your cock, finish. then tell us the stories. Please. Before you go on to Tex, finish cock. No, that's the story. That was, oh my uh, it was my story. He was a very, very nice man. The only other Hitchcock story I have both concerned the Academy Awards because uh -huh. he was nominated many times and never won. Is that right? Didn't and you? he once said to me, the Academy, it was exact quote, because I used to write this shit down. He wrote, he said, the Academy Awards are trivial bullshit. Unless you're nominated. Yes. And being a member of the Academy for 35 Ever? years or something, I, same thing, I was always, blah, blah, blah. and then when my wife, who was, was nominated for costume, for costume yeah. design, I was so thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> I was so excited. Coming to America, she was That's nominated. right, yeah. So, you know, then they are the biggest commercial for the movies, so you have to support the Oscars. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, but so the the um, how how did you wrangle? By the way, by the way, when Hitch, I have to say when sure. Hitch, Hitch, I was having lunch with Hitch, uh -huh. with uh, Hilton Green, who was his former producer, production man, was actually his former AD and then producer on the on the Psycho sequels <laughs> and stuff, and he was notified by phone by the British consulate that he was to be knighted. Oh my God! And he turned to Hilton and he said, "I must be dying." <laughs> and nice. he, but it was true also, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was like, anyway. Did, so did he actually know at that point? He was ill. Yeah. He, was, he, he lived another year or so, but he was not well. Right, right. <laughs> but so, he was just saying, oh, they're giving me a knighthood. I must be dying. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was yeah. like his Oscar. Yeah, well, Same yeah, thing, of course. You know? uh, so you, it's interesting that you um, spent that kind of time with him, that you sort of created those, those opportunities uh, I grew up in L.A., right. and this is my, I, I, you know, he's talked to film students, and it's like, I'm such a bad example. You know, I'm a high school dropout. I'm like, everything you're not supposed to have done. But I, uh, from, I saw, this is, this is true, but I've said it so many times, it is obnoxious. But I saw the seventh voyage of Sinbad mm -hmm. when I was eight years old at the Crest Theater on Westwood Boulevard. I grew up in Westwood behind the Veterans Cemetery. Right. And it changed my life. I had just had complete suspension of disbelief, you know. And I came home and I asked my mother, who, who does that? Who makes the movie? Who does that? And she said, the director, which was very sophisticated of her. Yeah, and, it was. And so from the time I was eight, you know, kind of like those kids in, in Super 8, although mine was just eight, but uh, I wanted to be a, a director. I wanted to make movies. And it's something that people forget because it's so chic now to be a director. Right, right. Is in the 50s and 60s, I mean, there were French guys like Truffaut and <laughs> Godard and those wacky guys who really admired 
um, American directors like John Ford and Howard Hawks and, you know, Hitchcock and Capra and stuff, George Stevens, but they, you know the joke, Jerry Lewis, they love them in France. Well, right. actually, yeah, because the French and the British had a very different perspective on, a, you know, American pop culture and on these filmmakers. They saw them as artists. Of course. So for Americans to seek them out, when I was a kid, I, I met everybody. Right. I made a point of meeting everybody. And <laughs> when I was a mailboy at Fox, I, George Stevens was shooting his last picture. Oh, um, my God. The only game in town. You're 17, 18 years old at this point. I was 17. 17. And I, and I went up to him and I said, Mr. Stevens, um, I just want to say I'm... To, to become a male, I had gone to a hippie school, so I had long hair, and to become a male boy, I had to cut my hair short and wear a tie. <laughs> no, it's only actors, directors could have, you know, producers could have long hair, sure. but not us. Um, and so I went up to Mr. Stevens, and I said, Mr. Stevens, I'm such an admirer, you know, whatever, I was babbling. And he looked at me, and he said, name five of my films. Oh, God. Because for an American kid to come up to him, so I remember going, uh, Alice Adams, um, you know, an American tragedy, uh, Diary of Anne Frank. You know, I'm like, I'm like, oh gosh, you know, I'm trying to. Did and I did. I named five five movies, and he was so impressed. He took me to lunch. Really? <laughs> yeah, where I sat there and watched him and his AD go over the schedule. But still, he took me to lunch. And, Jesus, uh, that's a remarkable. But it's it's just it really wasn't till the late '70s. Tell Adam the intern, by the way, who started today. Do not get any ideas. <laughs> You mean the rebel spy? The rebel spy. We're con Jamie's convinced, and now I'm starting to believe it. I from where? Exactly. We don't know. We don't know from the, what... Uh, the empire? The empire. Yes. We don't know which empire he's spying for. <laughs> but, no, I, so I, you know, and I, I did, you know, I worked on movies, I did all that stuff. But my exciting story, there was a purpose to this that's so lost. Tex Avery? No. No, no, no. <laughs> the working way with mail room, of course, 17, seeking out oh, directors, seeking out, that, making a that, point. That those guys, that yes. George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Brian De Palma, Francis Marty, all of those great filmmakers, all of those guys were nerds. Right. They were the guys. Film nerds. They were the audiovisual guys. We used to bring the projectors yes, yes. into the room. They were all... Nerds, and so really, Revenge of the Nerds is what's happened. You know, yes. they, they all became billionaires. And I don't it, know how I missed that. Well, it's now, yeah. What the hell? It's now true in the tech world. I mean, the geek shall inherit the earth. It's, right. it's happening, or has been for fifteen years. Uh, so you mentioned that early on, at, at the age of eight, the notion of this. So does mom at that point buy you a camera? An no. eight, an eight, not a super eight. <laughs> No, I bought. I I uh, actually worked. Paper route. How did you uh... babysitting? Okay. I used to get paid fifty cents an hour to babysit. All right. And, so seven uh, years later, you've got a camera. But six years later, I got a baby. I got a baby. <laughs> you got a baby, which is awesome. Well, listen, you're and, fourteen, and you that's sold not... the baby, and that's how you afford to go. <laughs> no, I. Um, but I, you know, and then, and I made the same stupid movies everybody made. You know, little stop motion claymation things like Ray Harryhausen stuff, and a kid named Jimmy Engelman and I. His big brother uh -huh. um, made Ravel models. Remember those? Sure. Beautiful, uh, beautiful like battleships and yeah. with rigging. He had all these like Spanish galleons and all yeah. this stuff with that model glue. My dad made those. I remember as a kid. He would spend hours build, with a toothpick painting the faces of the. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, so Billy Ingleman made all these, and Jimmy and I took them. And, you know, if you ever. Model glue burns really well. And we used to, we filled the sea battle in their in the Engelman's pool. Where the ship sets on fire. And then melts and gets in the filter, and then that was big trouble. We big trouble. <laughs> I see. You melted a ship into the pool's filter. A lot of ships and things. You used to make those kind of movies. And then later on, with 16 millimeter movies and stuff. So was there, uh, you, you mentioned the high school dropout. Was there... Um, Part of that fueling of that decision was it's time to get serious about my career as a director. Well, it, it, as soon as I could legally work, right? Which you was know, that it? Sure. To get, and also, I was being thrown out of school, but we don't talk about that. No, I went to a. I, uh, you went to the hippie school. You already well, said. Well, I went to Bellagio Road Elementary School, then Emerson Junior High, right behind the Mormon Temple. David Cassidy was in my class, and really? Bonnie. I'll never forget A Nine B Nine Talent Show. Bonnie Ray, who was a older than me, but. She came to sing with her father. Sure, John Ray. John Ray. It was like, it was a ringer. Why? She brought like a Broadway star. It's we not were so fair pissed at all. off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so I went, and then I would have gone to uni, but I didn't. I, I went to a hippie school called Oakwood, which is now kind of a 
big school, but at that time there were 50 students, and and uh, I was on a scholarship, and I was a, a high school scholarship. Yeah, I was on a, it was a private school. Right. I was on a half scholarship. It was expensive, you know. It was started by old Hollywood lefties, and uh, it, you know what's really interesting is this: out of 50 students, it had the children of Elmer Bernstein, uh, Ernest Gold, Jerry Goldsmith, mm -hmm. Alex North. I mean, some of the best film composers. It was amazing. That you and and uh, oh, I was Peter right. Bernstein. I ends went to school being, with Peter. Ends up being a friend of yours. Absolutely. You, yeah. And in fact, Elmer, when I made Animal House, and the studio said, "Well, who would you like to score it?" I said, "I'm going to ask Elmer Bernstein." And the head of music said, "He won't return your call." Right. And how did you get him to return your call? This is the guy who did Kill a Mockingbird, Ten Commandments. And The, the Magnificent, Seven, Magnificent Seven. All the all 12 John Wayne Westerns. I mean, he did so many. My Left Foot. What did he say when he returned? Well, he had call? never... Stop bothering me. No, actually, I called him and I said, Elmer, you know, Elmer took us to see the Beatles when I was 15. You At know. the Hollywood Bowl. The Hollywood Bowl. Well, you and Peter, I, I read that and, and I Andy thought... Gold. How oh magical was that? You couldn't hear... Thing. Really? Because they the were screaming. We were in a box, so they were like this big. You know, they were right there because of the screaming. You could, you have to remember they. Now everyone goes to a concert, and you can hear because they have the speakers. Then they were working out of their speakers on the stage. Oh my God! And now they have big stadium speakers, but then you couldn't hear a fucking thing. It was just screaming, but it was very exciting. So you were annoyed, really, at the Beatles? No, we were all <laughs> we were screaming. We were all excited. Yeah. Anyway, but um. So the exciting story. So Elmer came in and saw the movie, saw Animal House, okay. and he thought it was very funny. And he said, "John, I have never written a comedy score." And I said, "I want a straight score." Yeah, that's what I found fascinating. And he he did it, and it it was very successful. He was great. Yeah. I mean, Elmer, brilliant. Yeah. And then he scored a lot of movies for you him. You wanted to go against the grain, though, with the dramatic it, score. It wasn't. It's not so much against. It hadn't been done. Well, that's what I kind of meant by against the grain. Well, uh, it the the fact you know movie music. It goes in fashion. Sure. And the fashion for comedy was like Henry Mancini, who was, by the way, brilliant, but like the Pink Panther music, mm -hmm. you know, comedy music. And I felt that Animal House would be funnier. It's like Kentucky Fried Movie. I, I wanted, you know, I got, you know, Henry Gibson and Bill Bixby and any George Lazenby, anyone we could, who would do it. The George Lazenby. The George Lazenby. Yeah. And we, it was just a... I've always found straight actors are much funnier than comedians, forgive me, mm -hmm. when they're doing acting. Right. And uh, anyway, <laughs> that's why John Vernon is the dean in Animal House. I mean, yeah. I, I, I saw... Herbert, the Herbert Lom in the Pink Panther. Pink Panther, yeah. absolutely. I, I saw the outlaw Josie Wales, and John's the bad guy, and he had this yes. black beard and blue eyes, and he said, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. That's right. Which is exactly a Dean Wormer line. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Which was kind of brilliant, though, casting-wise. Well, you know, and then Jerry and David and Jim did it with with Airplane, you know, and use all the... I mean, who, who other than Peter Graves, you know, do you like Gladiator movies? I mean, if, if you saw Buddy Hackett doing it, it wouldn't be funny. Absolutely. It'd be disturbing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you guys do that when you worked on Kentucky Fried Movie? When you well, worked? sure, I cast it. You right. Know. But mean, did you cast against type in that, in that well, regard? Well, when we could. I mean, we had no money. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Um, but it became a style. And, and Leslie Nielsen, who had a huge career. I mean, Leslie was the captain of the you know, spaceship and Forbidden Planet. Oh, and... You yeah, know, I mean, I mean, he was in so many movies, Leslie yeah. Nielsen, and... And suddenly he's a comic actor. Yeah, you know, and he's, he's great. Uh, and when you uh, were originally doing the, um, well, you started with the schlock. We showed the. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. We showed the clip. <laughs> I loved that. You, as we're watching, he goes and he hits him with the pillow. Mm -hmm. And then when we included that part, you were you were happy. About well, I was that. pleased. I think that's funny. Well, I schlock is a you know it's an 88, 89 minute movie of which there's a really good, 11 or 12 minutes. The rest <laughs> is appalling. Well, that, you should say that about your first film, though. Come on. If your first... I want a title... Look what happened to Orson Welles. It doesn't work out when the first one's the best one. Do you, can you imagine making Citizen Kane when you're 24 or whatever he was? I mean, can you imagine? I mean... Yeah. I thought, I thought he was brought here by aliens. If he hadn't done all the radio stuff, then literally he's, he's not from this world, right? Orson was brilliant. But he learned storytelling already to that point. Well, he'd done tons of theater and radio. Crazy. Crazy. Have amazing. you ever seen the trailer for Citizen Kane? No. Okay. Find it. No, no, you can, because my friend Joe Dante has www.trailersfromhell. You ever been there? Oh, my God. Oh, it's wonderful. Trailers from Hell, it's free. Right. 
And Trailers from Hell is a website where directors, producers, and writers mm -hmm. do commentary on previews of movies. And oh it started... Oh, my God. It this sounds incredible. I can't believe you don't <laughs> know There goes the next seven weeks. It's terrible now because we've been doing it a couple of years, which means they're hundreds, so you can spend, just piss away, hours. <laughs> But it's got Guillermo del Toro and Edgar Wright and like Rick Baker and Roger Corman and just people yeah. I'm forgetting who will be pissed at me. <laughs> and um, but lots of producers and writers. And it's really interesting. It's you know trailers from hell. Yeah. It sounds absolutely incredible. Well, anyway, the trailer for Citizen Kane yes. is on there. If you go to Gurus and click Gurus because there's three trailers a week. Um, you'll see everybody's name who does it. Allison Andrews. I mean, tons of people. Right. And. Larry Cohen, his his are really outrageous because he's very candid. Good. <laughs> to, to, it's to the point of like, oh. anyway, but um, you click and see all the trailers they've done. Right. And one of mine is Citizen Kane. And what you can do with the trailer, for all the trailers, is you have the option to see the trailer with the original soundtrack without the voiceover commentary, which I suggest you do. And then you can listen to the commentary. But there are two I have. The trailer for Psycho. Have you ever seen that? The one Hitchcock shot? I th where he I gives you a tour of the Bates Motel? Mm -hmm. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. And, uh, and, and those two are the ones that you should listen without the commentary first. Right. Especially, you have to see, I, I'm just, I don't want to tell you why it's so special. But when you see the trailer for Citizen Kane, you realize, my God, there's something new going on here. Yeah. What he does is dazzling. Ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I, I want. I think that this moment in time when you're 19 and go off to Yugoslavia. I was 18. 18 I informed um, a lot of your creative senses, and I'll tell you why I think this. Uh, I mean, basically from your dossier, I, I, I felt very strongly like I, we're most impressionable at such an early age. The word discovery is a part of our mechanism because we don't, we're not aware. There's no self-awareness at, at, at that point, I believe, in our, our lives and our psyche. And being in a situation like you must have been on the set of that movie, behind the Iron Curtain, with these stars, as you have said in, in interviews, these stars with no place to go. Harry Dean Stanton basically growing pot behind the hotel, whatever. So, you know, he got, Harry got mad at me for saying that in an interview, so I hope he Why? doesn't... Why? He must be celebrating it now. Are you kidding me? I think a guy with his record gets upset when anything's mentioned like that. I would so. think with street cred alone, you, he would want it Harry, out there. Harry, you know, he's in his 80s and still working. Still working. And strong as Big an Big love, yeah. And a good actor. Solid as a rock. Yeah. But as an 18-year-old, uh, first of all, as a kid, uh, this movie had a tremendous impact for me because I was wildly, if not acutely, aware of Don Rickles, and it was the first time that I saw a comedian of that um, um, level do a extremely straight and believable role in a film. Um, although he was wisecracking a bit, his character... Jackie Gleason? Well, I guess when I think of Rickles, I think of a straight um, uh, sit uh, or stand-up. You never saw The Man with the X-Ray Eyes? Not till afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Not till after that. But honestly, it was the, a, a great well, run silent, run deep. Well, of course. <laughs> so no, tell no. me, at 18, in this world, in this new world, you were a gopher, which these days would be called a PA. Mm -hmm. um, you went from the mailroom off on this voyage. Uh, so, and also just being in Europe, the whole experience seems like... I was very naive in terms of... Um, I guess my mentor, you'd call him, I suppose. But the guy who was really kind to me was a wonderful director named Andrew Marton, mm. who was Hungarian, and so his name was Bundy. And Bundy Marton is most well-known. I mean, he made a lot of good I mean, he made King Solomon's Minds, wow. you know, with Stuart Granger. And sure. he made the first Thin Red Line. And uh, he made the first American movie to show a roll of toilet paper. Did he? Which was POW with Ronald Reagan. Oh, my goodness. A Korean War movie. And, but he made a lot, of a lot of movies. Started at Ufa and Silence. And, but he became known as an action director. So he directed The Chariot Race in Ben-Hur. Weiler's been her. He really? Yeah, he directed all the you fighting. You mean second unit stuff? Yeah, he became the second unit director, the go-to guy. Holy crap. In fact, uh, Billy Wilder once said that uh, he's going to do a movie where the boss calls his secretary in and makes an advance and she rejects it. So he literally chases her around the desk, but then he'd have to call Bundy in. 
Right. But Bundy did uh, like all the all the action stuff. He was the American director of the Longest Day. Did all those incredible things. He did uh, Fifty Five Days at Peking. He, you know, Nick Gray was drunk, so Bundy basically directed it. He he did hundreds of huge, these gigantic action pictures. And so He's he was mentor. This, he was my mentor, and he was the second unit director of Kelly's, Kelly's Heroes. Heroes. And he said to me, if you can get yourself, it was called The Warriors then, and if you could get yourself to Belgrade before we shoot, I could probably give you a job. So I told my mother that I had a job on this picture. And all you got to do is get me there, Mom. She didn't believe me at all. No, I couldn't tell her. I was going in the hope of a job. No. <laughs> so I had, at, by that, in the mailroom, I made $40 a week. And uh, we had, there was a kid, Peter Pasternak. I have no idea what happened to him, but he was Joe Pasternak's son. He was mm -hmm. a big producer. And he would call it Maserati. And I would think, how can he drive a Maserati on $40, $40 a week? <laughs> never, I never connected, you know. Anyway, you uh, um, so I had, I'd saved around $800, mm -hmm. which was enough to buy a one way ticket to London on TWA. <laughs> so I bought the ticket and showed my mom the ticket. She saw the ticket. So it must be true. Now it's a job. Yeah. So then I could get a passport, and I flew to London, where my guys I knew from Oakwood, Chris Hardman and Greg Gus. Chris's dad was a writer, Rick Hardman, and he was working for Carl Foreman in London. So I stayed with them for two weeks, and basically said, "How far is Belgrade from here?" <laughs> well, you're not driving, kid. Well, I was that stupid, truthfully, <laughs> and uh, so it took me like three weeks to get to Belgrade because I had to remember this is 1969, so 68, really 69, so it's hippies. So it was a different time. I mean, we used to hitchhike to San Francisco all sure. the time, and you know, Tijuana. I wouldn't let my kids hitchhike anymore, but we used to hitchhike all over the place. You can hitchhike across the country without e problem. Yeah. Easily. And uh, so I met some very nice English and Swedish hippies, and they taught me how to uh, ride what's called riding the whale rails. Rails. Oh yeah, riding the rails. Sure. Under the Orient Express, which had a lot of big, a lot of room. You could like get four people down there. That's the, how I went across the Iron Curtain the first time. Is it really? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but, um, it was. That was really something. That's something my, that people now, younger people, have no idea what that was like. I mean, the Iron Curtain was really. There's a movie called. Mm, I'd rather hear real life. I think version. it's What's New Pussy. Well, there's a movie in the 60s where there's a gag where you see West Berlin and there's parties and whoopee! And all this rock music, and then you pan over to East Berlin, and it's black and white and gold, and it's the, it, exactly like that. Yeah. You went across the Iron Curtain, and guys with, you know, Kalashnikovs and hammer and sickle and hobnail boots, and and plus, you know, the Allies rebuilt Europe after the war, but behind the Iron Curtain, you know, in, in 1969, 1970, when you went to Poland or Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia, or the, they were in ruins. Yeah. And Anyway, it was something. It was it was quite an experience. And then to have the Yugoslav army, the director Brian Hutton, we had hundreds. I mean, that one day we had like twelve hundred Yugoslav soldiers. That we in the morning they were Nazis, and in the afternoon they were Americans. Right. Changed uniforms. That's pretty great. We blew a lot of stuff up. And so I was like my war. My I always say my war experience. Yeah. My military experience, Kelly's Heroes, my college experience, Animal House. Right, right, hmm. right. Uh, well, truth be told, that. You are much more uh, in the moment in both of those experiences than you are at college, and, and then you are, you know. I mean, in, in actual wartime, I would imagine fear is, is getting you from one moment you know, to the next. It, actually, I, it's interesting because Animal House was such a phenomenon and remains such a phenomenon that I really tried to figure out now what did I do right there? How did that work so well? And I, and I think I know because my theory is was not intentional, <laughs> but I yeah. think the movie captures, and it was a wonderful cast, and it was written by three very smart guys who were in universities, in fraternities, in 19, what is it, 1963, mm -hmm. it's before, 62, it's before Kennedy, so it's 62, and it captures that, you ever hear, you know, the greatest generation, or a lot of people say that the war was the best years of their lives. Right. That the military was the best time. A lot of people say high school. Most people say college right. or the military. Right. And I'm thinking, what do they have in common? I realize, well, you're 18 to 22, and you're functioning as an adult, but you're still a kid. Yeah. And basically, I think that's why Animal House works, because that's what it captures. Even though it's very specific about things, the general ambiance of it is that that sense of 
whoopee, you yeah. know, like like I'm I'm a grown up, but not really, you and know. And then there's a sense of the inmates taking over the asylum as well. Uh, well, I don't know. Anim you know what? Animal House is an interesting movie because uh, studio wouldn't make that the way we were allowed to then. Right. Uh, now it's much more conservative all the way across the line. If you see a movie like Hangover or Bridesmaids, they have very happy endings where everything's neatly tied. Mm -hmm. I was outraged, for instance, by... Uh, I thought they were both funny movies, but I was terribly offended by... What was it? Juno and the other one was... Uh, Judd Apto is very funny. She gets knocked up. Oh, knocked up. Knocked up. Both of those movies basically are, are contemporary movies in which they say, have sex without protection, get pregnant with assholes, and if you're Katherine Heigl or you're an older person, then the jerk you slept with will mature, become a wonderful person, you'll have a wonderful life. If you're a high school girl, like in Juno, you have the kid, you give it away, it means nothing and you'll be fine. And it was like, if you remember, still the best high school movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Amy Heckerling's movie, she got pregnant, her brother takes her for an abortion. I mean, it's, it's very different. Um, and Animal House is a picture that takes place in 1962 right. and ends in civil insurrection. <laughs> it ends in chaos. There's no happy ending there, you right. know, you see. And, uh, and I was just fat. They wouldn't let you do that now. No. It's, no. A, it's, it's, it, I was very lucky to make movies in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, in, you were. Okay. In the studio system. Sammy? I have a question about Please. Animal House, if I may. Uh, many years ago, I got to work with Jamie Widows. Isn't he wonderful? He is the best. By the way, he looks exactly the same, I, which kind of pisses me it's off. It's freaky. Yeah. It is freaky. He has not aged a day. But uh, I He's asked him about Animal House. Years old. Oh, my God. And, uh, and he told me this story, which I'm hoping maybe you can shed a little different light on. So uh, you guys shot that in Oregon, right? Eugene, Oregon at Eugene. the University of Oregon. Right. And so I guess it was maybe the first week of shooting. All the guys are there. Oh, and he got beat up. <laughs> so then you know the story. Actually, on the new Blu-ray of Animal House, out this week, um, there's a documentary that was made, I don't know, like the last DVD of Animal House. Oh, you don't have to show it. Toss it over here. But there's a, In case there's, anyone forgot what the hell it looks like. <laughs> there was a, there's a good documentary on that, and what's fun about the documentary... <laughs> like, what, what, What's fun? What's fun about the documentary is, oh wait a minute, put that back in front of, in front of put it in front of me again, all the way in front of me. That would be good because then you have you hold it there, right? And it would be like, there's a documentary <laughs> on. <laughs> anyway, there's a documentary about the making of Animal House, and what's cool is you see interviews with all the actors. <laughs> you see, you see interviews. It's like Topo Shisho. <laughs> Keep going, please. Um, you see interviews with all the actors that were done every five years whenever they would repackage it and sell it again. Right. In fact, at the 30th reunion for Animal House, uh -huh. Martha Smith, who played Babs, said, the next time we do this, we're going to have to retitle it Animal Home. <laughs> but anyway, Jamie Widow's story that he yes. tells about being beaten up yes. is told in the documentary, but... In separate interviews with Karen Allen and Peter Rieger and Tim and Bruce McGill and yeah. Jamie, but at different times, and they're cut back and forth. It's wonderful, because oh, they're wow. cut back and forth. It's very funny. So real Rashomon. But it's also an amazing story that I knew nothing about. While it was happening. At, because when they came back, all beaten and bruised, yeah. they went to the AD. Now, the studio imposed on me. This is my first union movie and this, as a director. And the studio imposed on me this shit kicker AD named Cliff Coleman, mm. who I did not like the first three or four weeks of working with him because he was he was Sam Peckinpah's oh boy. AD on the Wild Bunch mm. and he was a tall, big boots, you know, just no nonsense. The statue of Emil Faber at the beginning, that's Cliff Coleman. I had them do Cliff Coleman. Um, I still have that head too. <laughs> anyway, but he was a he was a very smart guy and saved me a lot of trouble that I was even unaware of at the time. He right. did everything an AD is supposed to do. And one of the things he did, and I was pissed when I found out, but I realize now he did the right thing, which is that as soon as he got them all to doctors and everything, he said, don't tell Landis. Wow. wow. Because it's true, I was 27, I would have completely freaked out. Right. You know, so. Yeah. And if you want to know that story, the new Blu-ray of Animal there House is. is out There it is. I was going to say, let's not spoil it. Go get the Blu-ray. <laughs> They've seen it. Trust me. It's, right. it's been told that. Nauseam.
It just came out this week. <laughs> um, uh, so behind the Iron Curtain, when you, when you did mention, if I come back to just for a moment, when you just mentioned that um, there were these huge stars there. Well, Clint Eastwood was yeah. Telly Savalas, Carol O'Connor before uh, All in the Family. Yeah, right. Uh, but Sutherland... I Donald mean, Sutherland. I mean, how much trouble is he trying to get into while he's there? No, Donald, actually, I met Don Sutherland and Elliot Gould. I met them when I was a mailboy at Fox. Oh, boy. When they were doing MASH. MASH. And MASH, the two things about MASH, one is that st I think it was stage 17 or something, but m you could get high walking by the stage mm -hmm. because the marijuana coming out of the stage. And 66, 67, that was really scandalous behavior. And the whole movie was... Uh, Someone got an Oscar for that screen. Ring Lardner got an Oscar for the screenplay. And the whole time of shooting, he was sending outraged memos. Cause they keep the, changing my lines. In the mailroom, I read everything. Right. And he kept trying to get uh, Robert Altman fired. Because he changed my dialogue. everything. changed everything. Yeah. And a lot of the very funny stuff in that movie is post-production. Oh, boy. You know all those announcements? Yes. All post, all done later, all added, you know. And genius. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> anyway... I don't, there's stuff about that movie that it, it is genuinely kind of racist, and there's some weird shit in that movie, but it's also brilliant. Um, nonetheless, I met Don Sutherland and Elliot Gould then. Right. Um, so when a year later, I, oh, almost two years right. later, when I was in Yugoslavia, uh, I knew Don, and he was like, he knew me. Hey, kid. And yeah, and uh, I used to babysit for Kiefer, actually. Is that right? Yeah. When he was, he was, Hilarious. He was this Just a wee lad. Big. And. Um, and drunk. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> um, no but Donald, funnier than a drunk toddler. <laughs> no, but Donald actually got very ill. Mm. And, while uh, you were shooting. While shooting, he got the spinal meningitis. He got terribly Jesus. ill. Jesus. And had to go to London. And yeah, he... But he was playing this in... I mean, Kelly's Heroes is a weird movie. I, love I mean, he has a hippie in it, you know. Yeah. And who knew there was hippies in World War II? I don't know. But, um, but now from there, what I find interesting is that you had decided to hang around, spend some time in Germany and Spain doing it. Well, I went, it was the 69, we're really starting in 66 to about 74, was what's called the Spaghetti, spaghetti Western. Spaghetti Boom. Boom. In, um, in Spain. Uh -huh. It was basically Franco right. saying, come on. You know, it was very much like Tito said, come on. You know, it's like Marcos <laughs> in the Philippines. Come on. You know, dictators love the movie business. You right. Know? Um, and Hollywood just loves their fascists, you know. <laughs> anyway, but, um, yeah. so... And Kim Jong-il makes his own film. <laughs> Does he? Yeah, sure. I love, what, what's the Trey Parker that I'm won't, won't we, what is that? Yeah, the song? Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember the name. The, I'm won't we, that well, puppet from was... Team, yeah, from Team America. Team America, yeah, that yeah. puppet was the best thing in the movie. And I visited the set, because I, I love... Eric Mm -hmm. I Matt love Damon. puppets. Yeah. So I, I'm a big Matt puppet guy. Damon. So I went mm -hmm. to the set because the Kyotos were making the puppets and I wanted to see it and, and Matt and Trey let me come. And the coolest thing in that movie you don't really see in the movie. What's that? Which is that Kim Jong il's palace, that giant palace, it's made completely from Chinese takeout cartons. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My favorite thing in that picture is he's walking down the hall of his palace. Yeah. And he passes that display case with Hummel figures. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, pretty great. Anyway, um, back to no. Spain. Let's jump around. What happened with Spain was, I was yes. uh, 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 finishing on Kelly's Heroes. You don't want to go home. I want to work on movies. Is it true? Nine months. I was there ten months on that film alone. On that though. film, most actors were there six to eight months, going crazy. Right. I mean, there was literally nothing to do. This one hotel. It was pretty funny. I mean, you know, just <laughs> Telly Savalas, who was wonderful, the Golden Greek. Yeah. I mean... Uh, Get me out of here, though, at some point. Well, women were being imported from oh, other countries. I and, see. And uh, it, it was pretty wild, but it was... Brian Hutton himself is a real character, the director. The director, was at real times, called insane. No, definitely not insane. No? No, 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 no. Okay. Not insane. I liked him a lot, and he was not insane. Okay, good. Had a very New York sense of humor. Oh, well, that's He true. also hired, he was <laughs> loyal to the friends in his neighborhood. So if you ever look at Kelly's Heroes, there are about 10 actors there who have no business being in front of a camera. <laughs> like they're deli guys and bookies and people he knew from the hood in you know, Brooklyn. Um, right. But anyway, that was a great experience. Off to Germany to be a stuntman. Well, first to Spain. Right. I, I went with Jim O'Rourke, who was uh, a college student who was six four. He, was, I mean, he doubled Clint Eastwood in the movie. He was just, 
you speak English, you want a job, you know? Yeah. And uh, he and I went to Spain, first Madrid and then Almeria, and I became a stuntman, like a bad joke, because it was a movie and the British production manager who named Terry Lenz, Jim and I are standing in front of him, and Terry says, do you do horse falls? And Jim, you said, of course. I said nothing. Jim goes, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, and the next day, I, I'm a hussar with 300, you know, charging into the valley of death with explosions. And I got very good at it, though. I'll bet. I really did. I, I worked on Once Upon a Time in the West. I worked on My Name is Nobody, oh, boy. Town Called Bastard, Lawman, um, Chattos Land. I did a lot of Westerns. What I, was the deal with My Name is Nobody? He spoke no English. They dubbed the whole thing. There was most, some... most Italian films at Terrence... that time. Hill. Hill. Whose real name was, you know, ba -ba -da -da -ba -da. Yeah. Most. Italian movies. That was literally that, his name, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Most Italian films at that time were shot silent. In fact, all of the great, you know, La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half, all those pictures were shot silent and then dubbed. And Fellini used to have actors just say the alphabet or count, do all kinds of stuff, and, and they would be dubbed later. Yeah. Um, I worked on a picture called Red Sun. Mm. I, Alain Delon is a bad guy, and I'm one of the four guys behind him looking, you know, like uh, I was greased up and long. I was like supposed to be Mexican, um, big sombrero and guns. You could hardly see me. So, I, but um, I did a scene with in that movie. Uh, Terrence Young, filmmaker. Terrence Fisher. Fisher. Terrence Fisher. Ter I forgot. But the d English director. But there's a scene in Red Sun with Toshiro Mifune, Charles Bronson, Ursula Andress, Elaine Delon, us, uh, Fernando Rey. Couldn't get anyone. And some other people. No, but the point is. Bronson spoke English, Delon spoke French, Ursula Andress spoke English and French, Mifuni spoke Japanese. They, you know, and it was just like, point, say your line, point, say your line. And uh, it was all dubbed later. Dubbed it out later. Yeah. So I, I can't imagine you want to go home at that point. But no, I was in Spain a year. Yeah. But I, you, I worked on about 75 to 100 pictures. I loved it. And so the reason I said at the outset that I think your time there uh, was this crazy, fast-paced, jam-packed education that informed uh, your desire starting at age eight to be a filmmaker. And now you're on these sets one after another. I had no idea to this uh, number, this ridiculous capacity. Oh, I worked a lot. I'm in a lot of, you ever seen a Battle for the Planet of the Apes? Well, I was going to say. <laughs> Battle because for the Planet of the Apes? Yes. I, yes. Did you ever see Towering Inferno? Yes. Set me on fire, throw me out a window. But you're one of the few humans in Battle uh, I of the I am. Planet I played, actually, I'm cut out of the movie. I get a big credit, but I'm, I'm you see me under the, the main title, big close up, and that's about it. And then you see me later if you're looking for me. But it, uh, I, my part was, J. Lee Thompson, the director, mm -hmm. was an Englishman. Um, did you ever see The Exorcist? Sure. The character Alec McGowan is playing, the drunken English director, is J. Lee Thompson. All righty. Uh, William Peter Blatty wrote a movie called John Goldfarb, Please Come Home. Mm -hmm. And J. Lee Thompson was director, and that was his revenge. Ah. But I knew J. Lee, uh, he, he directed Guns of Navarone. Sure. Uh, I knew him sober <laughs> and older, and I thought he was lovely. But, but working on Battle for the Apes was a riot because I had like six weeks work. I was in it a lot, but my whole my whole thing was cut out. I was no jokes. Roddy McDowell in the movie has a son. I was the nanny <laughs> to the son. No and, jokes needed. And, and it was I got a lot of jokes on the set. But one day at lunch, you see one of these um, uh, actors dressed as an ape, and he's reading. Well, um, you know, you I guess you. Where did I tell that story before? How I we do that? our research. No, you're talking about, an, we're shooting at the Malibu Ranch, which is now yes. public park, I think. And uh, lunch, long table of apes and humans were eating. And there was this tall and thin orangutan mm -hmm. makeup. Um, and he was smoking, you know, the smoke, they had to have cigarette holders. And he's smoking and reading a book. Anyway, it was just at the, at the end of the meal, uh, an AD came up and said, we're ready for you, Mr. Houston. The guy stood up and I was like, <laughs> that orangutan? I had lunch with John Houston and didn't know it? <laughs> I, I knew him, I met him later and got to talk to him. But. You didn't get a chance to talk to him too much on that particular No, show. not at all on that show. I asked him about that. I said, why the hell were you in front of the He said, you take the money. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Holy crap. I thought it was a good answer. Well, let take me ask you this about him as a filmmaker. Did you ever hear, I, I, I hope this isn't apocryphal because I, I've, I've quoted it far too many times, that he would often sit by the sticks uh, while they were shooting and 
close his eyes and while, fall the, asleep. while the actors did the scene. And fall asleep or just close no, his eyes? No, as a way to, to uh, decide whether or not the take was any good. I don't know. I do know that when John didn't care, he would fall asleep. He often would fall asleep. <laughs> or my favorite is Stallone. Stallone, Sylvester Stallone, told me a story uh, on a movie called Victory, mm. which is you oh, are I Michael Caine. Tell it. You love that. I movie? love Victory. Yes, sir. I'm proudly telling you. I every time. Every time Pele does the bicycle kick and they do the weird 70s play it multiple times from six different angles, I always think, well, this is great. <laughs> we don't see enough of this anymore. That's why we keep him around. Pele, come on. So Stallone's Stallone's so, so Stallone, <laughs> Stallone, it's they're shooting in Hungary in, in bitter cold winter. And, in this, and he did, took the movie to work with John Huston, who was older then. And, and John's sitting in a Volvo wagon, heated. It's bitter cold, ice, sleet cold. And John says, Sly, uh, you know, you're going to run, you get to the barbed wire, guns are firing, you just fall onto the wire. Won't hurt you, it's, you know, plastic, but you fall on the wire and you scramble and you climb over and then you fall into mud and you and you just keep running. And it's pouring rain. And, and, and Sylvester says, well, how will I know when you say cut? He says, well, I'll blink, I'll blink the lights and the car will blink the lights. And we'll flash him, and you'll know that the scene is over. Because I want you to run. And Stallone says, oh, okay, sure. So the action, and he's running and doing and running. And finally, he's running. Jesus Christ. He turns around, he looks, and sees two little red lights going further and further away. They didn't flash the lights, they drove away? <laughs> they just, he just rapped. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the time he came back, he was lucky to get a ride, you know. <laughs> Was that just his way of saying, go fuck yourself, or just having fun? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was very nice, John Houston, and and some, he said something. It was a line in Chinatown, right? But he said it in my presence uh, to me. He said that motion picture directors, prostitutes, and buildings grow respectable with age. With age. And I just turned sixty, and in today's New York Times, Animal House, and Blues Brothers got the DVDs got good reviews. And when they came out, no, they were sh all my pictures except. Trading places, not really, but the others were pretty much shit upon. And so now these pictures are like classic films, and the only difference is I'm 60. Mm -hmm. With age. So if I'd known that, I would have been I would have been 60 earlier. You yeah, know? yeah, I don't know, but <laughs> that's what you were somehow trying to figure out. Uh, speaking of the puppeteer, you worked on a picture called the Muppet Movie as a puppeteer. Only in one scene, only two days. Grover. I did Grover. I was very honored that Frank asked me to do Grover. Right. And, and gave me a whole lesson about how the Muppet attack. Whereas Puppet talks like, well, I should go this way. Puppet talks like, there you go. Puppet talks like this. A Muppet talks like that. You attack the word. That was the difference of a Muppet. Anyway. Nice. So, well, they, in the, have you ever seen the Muppet oh, movie? Oh, sure. Well, the end of it is every single Muppet character from Sesame Street and all their different things in a big pit singing some song. And Miss Piggy and Kermit are in the front. Mm. So... Frank asked me if I'd do Grover, and I'm in the pit somewhere. And years, a great story, about 20, 30 years later, I'm at a restaurant, The Grill in Beverly Hills, and Tim Burton, who I don't know, stops at my table, and he says, John Landis, I'm Tim Burton. I said, I know, I'm such a fan, hi. And he goes, do you know we work together? Did we? Yeah, and he says, do you remember? He was a puppeteer. He was an animator and a puppeteer in the union, and he was in the pit. And he said that everyone was going, that's the guy that directed Animal House. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim Burton's in that hole, too, with me. So there you go. <laughs> Little known fact. The other directors that came from that hole, I'll have you know, are... Um, all right. So, uh, Jamie, you had a question, I believe, uh, that I would like to go to at this point, please. Oh, yes. I, as you can see, I'm a huge Disney nerd. Oh, by yeah. the way, where'd you get that, that Snow White decal? I, I just it. Googled it and I found it. Yeah. What do yeah. you Google? Snow White decal yeah, for Mac? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Because my daughter Etsy. is... Well, she, I started the collection for her when she was too big to know what the hell was going on. But she has a huge Snow White collection. Mm. She's, she's my favorite princess. I think she's the prettiest. Of course. But anywho, um, in Beverly Hills Cop 3, I thought it was really inspired that you chose to pick the Sherman Brothers to um, write the theme for uh, uh, Wonder, Wonder World, World right? right? Yeah, and that was your idea, I take it, right? Yes. And I just, I just want to know, like, is that because you're a huge Disney fan as well? I mean, like, I am know? a huge Disney fan. I am. I, I think Walt Disney was strange, but a genius. 
a real genius. And his biggest impact on culture is architectural. People mm. don't seem to know that, but really, I mean, the whole world's become Disneyland. I mean, 42nd Street's Disneyland now. And the, the mall. The, the walking in, malls. The mall with yeah. Main Street. And, uh, you know, it's just... Um, but the it, Sherman Brothers in particular, you were well, the, Have you seen that documentary? Yes. Isn't it good? It's it spectacular. Is great. Well, that's be also, too, is because I think that was the beginning of their estrangement. Whenever it was whenever no no it wasn't that it when you worked with them the they were still they no were still no no close. they had been, no their estrangement goes back a long time oh, good but way they, they you know what they don't talk about in the documentaries there's you know Richard and Robert yes and um, one of them well and they talk about one is older than the other and during World War II one enlisted very early and he had his World War II experience was horrendous. They don't really talk about it. He was the first man in the Dachau. And his, he was with a troop of southern soldiers. And they hated the Jew. And his lieutenant used to say, it's your war, you go first. And he had a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I mean, you know, like in Saving Private Ryan, that kind of, mm. he went through a lot of that stuff and had his leg shattered by a mind. He came back from the war profoundly depressed and, and damaged. And his brother was like, boola boola, boola boola, <laughs> you know, and just didn't understand. And right. it started there, really. But they they have issues, but man, they were See, they now were, that I didn't know. Brilliant. And yeah. now it, it feels, I'm always like, oh, the older brother, what a dick. I didn't know No, this. no, the, neither are dicks. Yeah. No, 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 they're both great. And do you know how that movie came about? Or I think they talk about it in the documentary about their, their sons. No, yeah, their sons did. Well, the, right the, well, their son, Greg and Jeff Sherman, um, the same age, mm. grew up within six blocks of each other in Beverly Hills, didn't know each other. Because their brothers were not speaking. Because they, well, the, the, Dick and Bob never socialized. They, they worked together and won Oscars together, but they had no social. And at the premiere of Mary Poppins, uh, the stage show in London, mm. um, Jeff is on one side of the auditorium with his family, and Greg is on the other side, and they think, it's ridiculous. We both went to Beverly High. We don't know each other. So they went over and talked, and what's going on? You know, and basically, they made that wonderful documentary that, what's it, what was it? It's uh, called The Boys. The, the Boys. Boys. Yes. Which you, Thanks, can, what camera? You can get it on Amazon.com. <laughs> it's a brilliant documentary. I think that, it's on On Demand right now, actually, because it? it was on, like, Well, you know, one of one the one reasons of the they don't go really into some of the most interesting stuff is because Disney financed and, and mm -hmm. put it out. As it is, I think it's, it's darker than you expect. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, but it, who, who really, other than maybe Cole Porter and Irving Berlin and you know, George M. Cohan has had that kind of impact as the Sherman brothers. Yeah, it's true. And when you worked with them, what was the experience like for you? I mean, as you well, said, you great. had this it's idea. Great. Well, you, if you saw the doc, I said it was great working with them, and then I wanted them to be in the movie. Yes. And then, so they're both in the film in separate scenes, and then I had to cut one of them out. Mm -hmm. And the glee with which the one brother... Because you cut the younger brother out. Yeah. And I thought, so, but in the documentary, we actually went to Paramount, found the footage, so it's in the documentary, the cutout scene. Oh, nice. Beverly Hills Cop 3 is a weird movie. It's a, um, a movie I did for the money. And uh, Eddie Murphy and I had had terrible falling out on Coming to America. Right. We worked together very well, but, it, you know, I'll never forget he said, all right, we'll finish the movie, but we won't be friends. I said, okay, deal. Nice. You know? Well, you were done trading places. At a, a he was, by the way, trading places. He was fabulous and wonderful and happy. Eight years later, did Coming to America, a miserable son of a bitch. Right. So, uh, but interestingly enough, I think eight years after that, Sherry Lansing called me and said, do you want to do Beverly Hills Cop 3? And my question was, who's going to play Eddie Murphy? <laughs> and she said, no, Eddie... I think it was I think it was Eddie's way of apologizing. I'm not sure. I actually saw Eddie recently, like a month ago. Um, had a very nice time with him. But Cop Three was a weird experience because it was a bad script, and they had to have it in theaters by August. Yeah, this is the fastest, like three weeks. Well, no, Coming to America is the fastest. Coming to America is the worst. yeah is yeah. the fastest. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, Beverly yeah. Hills Cop Three was fast. Right. And I thought, well, we can make this funny. Beverly Hills Cop. The original Marty Brest movie is a terrible screenplay. Hmm. The movie is very funny. Yeah. And it's funny because of Marty Brest and Eddie Murphy. Hmm. And if you see Beverly Hills Cop, everything funny in it is an improvisation or like Bronson Pinchot. He's an ex, a day player. That's hmm. all made up. Right. Um, 
you know, and Marty's a clever guy, and they hired, you know, Judge Reinhold, who's a good, clever guy, and they, all the weigh-ins and all that stuff, that was just, I mean, all the funny lines came from Eddie. They were not, they made that movie funny. I personally don't like Cop 2. It was a huge hit. Um, yeah, the yeah. first one at one point they were considering Stallone. I mean, it was, it was it written was, for Stallone. Right, it was a darker. It was it was the same script, but but meant the the intent rather was not darker, just straighter, more straight. And uh, it was a bad script, and right. um, and then Katzenberg said, "We'll get Eddie to do it because Twenty be Places funny. was such a big hit." Right. And he, he was smart, hired Marty Brest, and they made a really funny movie. So I flattered myself and said, "Well, I can do that," you know. So I tried to get all my Disney stuff in it, and I did. I was successful at some of it, mm. but. It was an odd film because, uh, I mean, Eddie will admit this probably, but the, I thought, well, Eddie can be brilliantly funny when he wants to. Right. He's perverse enough to not want to. I mean, I had the first day I gave him shtick and he said, Axel wouldn't do that. <laughs> Why not, Eddie? Axel's a man now. Oh, my God. It was like, <laughs> say what? <laughs> um, <laughs> what it was was he, he, was, he, wanted to be, he wanted to be an action guy. Right. So if you look at that movie, it's like a setup for Eddie, and then Eddie's like a whoop right around it because he's straight, basically. And it's, I hate that movie, but there's things in it that are good. There are funny things in it, and moments I like. And there's and a chance to work with the Sherman Brothers, which let's just face it, at the end of the day, one of the highlights. Have you, you know what? Did you see Iron Man two? Sure. Oh, because, that was fantastic. Too. Because How John the Stark Favreau Expo is a clearly did is a Disney freak. Yeah, the Stark freak. Expo is Epcot. Yeah, he did yeah. Epcot. He, he had a guy World's playing Fair. Disney. John Stark Slattery. John Slattery. Yeah, yeah. John Disney. Slattery. He did. I mean, you know, clearly I said this guy must have seen Cop three. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But he clearly is also a Disney guy. Oh, yeah. he's a huge Disney guy. He's. I always see him at the parks. <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. He loves it. Now, you wanted to get uh, Danny Aykroyd initially for Animal House. Lauren wouldn't let him out. It, we have to, well, wait. Doug Kenny, Chris Miller, and Harold Ramis. Right. The writers of the very funny screenplay of Animal House, very smart screenplay of Animal House. They, they, there was Second City in Chicago. Yep. Second City in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then there was National Lampoon, which Lampoon. drew on both Second Cities. Um, and there was, from Chicago, John Belushi went to Toronto to meet, to, I think to teach or something. And uh, that's where he met Danny and Gilda and Paul Schaefer and those people. And what's interesting is the Blues Brothers. John and Danny made up the Blues Brothers long before Saturday Night Live. And it still bothers me that they say it's a Saturday Night Live skit because we had a deal, a, a development deal, Right. Uh, to do a Blues Brothers movie before they performed as Jake and Elwood on television. Did you ever notice that Lorne Michaels or NBC, or they have nothing to do with the Blues Brothers? Right. It's us. But, I found it was great that they owned the characters before they got well, to Well, they SNL. owned them because they, made, they, they had, a, they was a way of them performing the music, and right. uh, I went to, when I went to New York to try to get, well, finish the first part of the story is, so Harold Ramis knew Belushi from Second City in Chicago, right. and then Doug Kenny from The Lampoon and Chris Miller from The Lampoon, when The Lampoon did their show uh, called Lemmings, Lemmings. off-Broadway show. Yeah. Do you remember the cast of that? I it, had Christopher Guest here talking about it. It's Chris Guest, uh, Chevy, Chevy Chase, John Belushi, Harold Ramis, Gilda Radner, yeah. I mean, extraordinary, um, Tony Hendra. Um, and anyway, the point is, so all these people knew one another before Saturday Night Live. Yeah. So when they wrote Animal House originally, which was really before Saturday Night Live, when they started, not when I started, right. um, they wrote parts specifically, D-Day was written for Dan Aykroyd. Chevy for Otter. Chevy for Otter, um, John for Bluto, yeah. and there were some others. Harold Ramis wrote the part of Boone for himself. Mm -hmm. He's probably still mad at me that I didn't cast him because... <laughs> He was 10 years older than everybody else. Right. <laughs> and uh, on a, he wasn't the actor that Peter was, but um, brilliantly funny. In fact, I, I said to the, the writers, I want you guys to come on location, but Universal won't give me the money. It was really low budget. So tell you what, come to location, get to Eugene, and I will hire you every day as actors. And you will make a little bit of money, and you won't lose money. Right. So Doug Kenny and Chris Miller took me up on it, and Harold was pissed off that he didn't get to be <laughs> Boone, and he didn't. But um, Doug, Kenny and Chris, Doug Kenny was brilliant. Yeah. And that script was extraordinary. So that's why I met Dan Aykroyd. I went to New York to get 
Dan and John, and uh, they wanted the studio wanted Chevy desperately, and I didn't actually. Right. Um, although I found I your reason interesting twice. that he had popped so much. On he was SNL, the star on SNL at that point that it was no longer appropriate. I'm Chevy Chase, and you are not. He was the only one who identified himself, and he right. was funny and handsome, and uh, I didn't want him. The studio was desperate to have. Him. I'm sure he's marketable. And, and they wanted John and Danny. And uh, John, actually, I got uh, because, you know, he loved martial arts movies and also Japanese movies, but he loved kung fu. And he saw a Kentucky Fried movie before it came out. The thing that still amazes me is I was hired for Animal House before a Kentucky Fried movie was released. Yeah, how is that possible? Amazing. <laughs> Ama I'm still amazed. And I was hired in a step deal. I was hired to, de to develop the script because the script was hysterically laugh out loud funny, but it was also truly offensive. Uh, uh, Animal House. Animal House. Yeah. So I was hired to develop the script. Make it less offensive. To make it not less offensive. I like offensive. Um, but to make it uh, palatable to me. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, because there were no good guys. Everyone was a pig. <laughs> Everyone in it was a pig. <laughs> and I, I softened it quite a bit. And I made them, I mean, it's their script. I don't want to take any credit. My only, my only real addition to that script is making, I said, there must be good guys. And so that became the Delta House with the good guys. Mm. Yeah. Before you couldn't tell, they were all pigs. It was yeah. all pretty funny, though. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, so when Aykroyd plunks down a 600 or more page script. That's years later. That's years many later. years later for Blues, 600 plus pages for Blues Brothers and says, fix it. No, you have to remember, here's what happened. John and Danny, the Blues Brothers, and. Uh, it's the kind of situation, I've, I've had this twice, where people I'm involved with are so hot mm. and the studio is so desperate, they say, can you have, both times, can you have this picture in theaters in August? And I think about it and go, Jesus Christ, you know, and both times there was no script. Holy and both times that was like two months pre-production of that. And then, you know, no post-production. But I knew that if I said yes, I was, you know, there I was. So one was Blues Brothers, another was uh, Coming to America. Right. And I so, mentioned the quick turnaround on Coming America. America. I didn't mean to brush over too quickly, uh, but no, it's that astounding. picture never even had a preview. Yeah, that's the thing that I, I found interesting. That uh, when in talking about the DVD releases and the extras, and and if there's any changes to be made, um, or any, it, you, the feeling was you never had a chance really to to test the film. No, Coming to America was a prof my most successful film. People think it was. I mean, that made a billion dollars. That was like a huge, <laughs> and continues to do well around the world. Um, but three weeks of well, post. but wait, but that's not really fair because w what I was doing, I had. I was cutting, sure. scoring, and mixing during principal photography. Oh, you're right, because that was fair. No, that's not fair, <laughs> but, I, but it wasn't three weeks for everything. I mean, we were shooting it that way. Right. And uh, no, it was nuts. And so I still think that movie is too long. When I, did you sleep? Did you just get used to two no, hours? I, I slept. I mean, you know, it was, you do it. You cutting, know. composing? I'm not composing. No, but. I'm going, well, Niall Rogers, who did a brilliant score. Um, right. He, would, he didn't get sleep. <laughs> right. But, I mean, you have to be involved in all of these things. Oh, sure. And, and when I say involved, I mean in charge of. So while others are, are composing and doing the work, uh, and uh, you still, have, while you're shooting, have all the responsibilities of this. It, you know what? It's just money. I mean, if, if they give you the money to do it, then you can do it. You hire extra editors and you have people, and it's, it's not, you're going to hate this. But I don't think filmmaking is that hard. Filmmaking should be fun. Mm. And I, as a direct, as a person, in various, I've done everything you can do on a movie but hair. That's right. I performed every job but hair. You did makeup once. Oh, many times, actually. But uh, badly, too. But um, Horribly, I was going to say. <laughs> no, I would say something so cruel, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, the filmmaking should be a pleasure. Right. And even, even when it's difficult, it should be fun or energetic or challenging or exciting. It doesn't have to be hard. They make it hard sometimes. Right. And you obviously have weather problems and actor, whatever, whatever the problem is. But the hard part is getting the money. Sure. You know, that's the most difficult part. How, have you always been good at the troubleshooting aspect of it? Because you mentioned the actors and the this and the well, that. Hitchcock said motion picture production is constant compromise. Yeah. With extremely few exceptions, Stanley Kubrick, um, David Lean, who else? I mean, uh, Eric von Stroheim, um, right. and maybe Spielberg. I don't know, but Woody Allen, you could argue. 
And, yeah, well, Woody Allen's had the luxury of reshooting entire pictures. I've never, <laughs> I've never even reshot. Yeah. I've never had it doesn't to. seem to compromise anything. But it's it's you you need uh, the opportunity to do it. Yes. And um, when you're shooting, it is a constant compromise. You rarely get exactly what you want. Mm. I mean, I've worked on movies where I don't understand where the director is doing 45 takes. I'm thinking, what the fuck is he going to get from? What? But there are a lot of directors who do that. Right. So you can't you can't question someone else's method because I mean, Stanley Kubrick was downright irresponsible right. the way he made movies. But his movies are great. So. And he, and he, uh, there, you could, one could argue that he he rarely made them to entertain masses. He always made them. He was very concerned about commercial success. Well, he was why he had. It's he was, not very apparent in the outcome. Oh yeah, sure. No, Stanley was very involved in the marketing of his movies and everything. He was he was very concerned and right. uh, and usually did very well. Do you think they'd give him money to do these wacky pictures that they didn't think they were going to make money? Well, no. I They're don't not mean, patrons of the arts. I don't mean to suggest that he was uh, a non-compromising son of a bitch. Who he wasn't did, a son of a bitch. This bit. is all you get. Um, but rather, his style of storytelling. Um, Clockwork Orange. Seemed to purposely not f uh, 2001, fit into any structure. All of those, Doctor Strange, all of those movies made fortunes. Even, uh, what's the Vietnam one? Um, uh, uh, Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal, they all made, they were huge hit movies. Right. Barry Lyndon was not a big hit movie. Although I quite like Barry Lyndon. That's a great movie. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like the only thing, that, that and Paper Moon are the two Ryan O'Neill movies. I think Ryan O'Neill is really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zero Effect. Do you know that I've one? I've never seen Zero. Oh, you should. That's Jake Kasdan, son of Lawrence Kasdan. That was his debut picture. <laughs> Jake Kasdan, son of Lawrence. <laughs> I, I now have Matt Landis, son of John. I have a very <laughs> successful screenwriter son. Yeah, how is that going? He's doing fantastic. You know, I mean, people, I mean, he's got a picture and post at Fox, mm -hmm. which he's thrilled with. The writer's thrilled. I can't get over. Um, Is that possible? You know, he, uh, he has a picture with uh, Mark Wahlberg and Jonah Hill, Jonah Hill? Hill mm -hmm. attached to it. He's got, he's got, he's writing a picture for Ron Howard. I mean, he's got seven movies around town. He's unbelievably smart, talented, prolific, and successful. Uh huh. And you insisted that he go all the way through high school. He, he didn't finish college. <laughs> no, but good. you know, but but um, there's hope. I didn't insist. You know, Max. I'm fascinated by it. the only thing I want him to know is it won't always be like this. Right. <laughs> you know, Max. I mean, he just bought a condo. I mean, he's doing. People say, why don't you get Max to write you something? I can't afford him. <laughs> uh, our, our dear friend of ours uh, and a past guest, uh, a new filmmaker by the name of Adam Bush, wanted me to ask uh, you about the Scenesters, uh, Judge Paxton B. Johnson. What can you tell us about that? Only that the uh, Todd, uh-oh. The filmmaker. What's his last name? Let's just go with Todd for now. Oh, no. It's not a quiz. I'm sorry, Todd. Yes. The, the director of that, yeah. uh, I, was in, I hired as a writer once, mm -hmm. and he's a very talented and smart guy. And he asked me to be in it, so I was in it. That's all it took. And, and you had fun. You I still mean, enjoy it. Sure. You know, that, remember that? I think the most fabulous commercial in history. Remember when Robert w Young used to play Marcus Welby? Sure. He, would, he did those commercials for uh, aspirin. He'd say, I'm not a doctor. First, he'd say, first, they'd say, Robert Young. And then he'd come out in a white doctor's coat and he'd say, I'm not a doctor, but, but I, I play, play one, one on TV. TV. And then he'd give you medical advice. I always feel, you know, I'm hired a lot. I'm in, a, you know, I'm in like 200 I'm movies. I'm not an actor. I'm not an actor. But, but I play 200 one in films. the movies. Yeah. <laughs> Todd Berger. Todd Berger, thank you. Todd Berger, the very gifted writer, director, and star of that movie. Scenesters. Scenesters. You had fun and you recommend people should Although see it. Although when I saw the movie, I thought, Wait a minute, he just, I'm a cutaway. There's no establishing, there's no master of the room. I John, to it turns him. out you're not actually that good. <laughs> it's just good to have you, but uh, you get in the editing room and you go, how do I cut, I, you know cut I, this guy out? I think he put, no, I had, I mean, I, everything I did is in the movie, but <laughs> I, I think I was there two hours. But he, I think he wanted me in the movie for those, you know, for the Europeans who would go, 
Was that John Landon? You know, that. Well, we brushed over the Kubrick, but the truth is the famous uh, See You Next Wednesday comes from 2001. It's not famous. Well, it's famous for your fans. <laughs> it's infamous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, if you saw Three Amigos, he's so famous. He's, beyond, he's so famous. He's, he's infamous. In there you go. <laughs> we do All have Three time. Amigo fans, and that's what I All want to talk time. about Wait, next. Speaking of Three Amigos, I just Please. spent two weeks. Uh, working, restoring Three Amigos. Um, Did you? It's coming out on Blu-ray this year or next year. I don't know from HBO, but it's gorgeous. It looks like three strip Technicolor. Wow. I really spent time. Plus, we found an early preview print, so there's about 20 minutes of stuff that was cut out that's now. Get out. Part of these special back. features. Oh, Actually, wow. one of my favorite I didn't realize it was not in the movie. I've been quoting it for years, and I realized, <laughs> oh my God, it's not in the movie. Where uh, El, El Guapo, the wonderful Alfonso Rao, and uh, Tony Plana, Jefe, is, is, Jefe says, shall I kill him? And El Guapo says, Jefe, Jefe, we are not animals. We do not kill people for no reason. And <laughs> Jefe goes, sometimes we do! <laughs> you know, and I thought, oh my God, that's not in the movie. For years I've been saying, sometimes we do! And no wonder people go like, what's he talking about? <laughs> anyway, you can see it on the Blu-ray when it comes out. I, I love that, that you had so to... often. Yeah. I was in Target a while back and I knocked down a display and I went, son of a motherless goat! And then a guy that I didn't know from like aisles away like finished the quote. Really? <laughs> yes. That, you know, that's an interesting thing. That Of all the films I've made, I think that one, maybe because it's was not a big hit, but I think it's very funny. It, it makes is hilarious. Laugh. Oh, we were watching a it a little bit movie. of it the other night when they all take a shot of tequila and they all do a different spit take. It's <laughs> that hilarious. wonderful Fred Asparagus, the guy who plays the bartender. Bartender. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A while, a while. That's a different actor there. Yeah. But the... Uh... You had to say to Steve Martin early on, well, you know, Steve, the Mexican actors... Oh, he wasn't amused. ...have all the funny lines. Well, I just felt that the Benditos had the funny stuff. Yeah. And the Amigos are... Vain actors, you know, <laughs> but they're, but they're, and Steve was like, yeah. but he's, you know. You, you know what's interesting is uh, people don't realize Randy Newman was one of the writers of that script and is the singing Bush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least we forget. Um, I don't know what ever happened to him. How'd you know yeah, it was yeah, a mail yeah. plane? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> he never got a little false. I'm tickled by, I always love in anything where someone tells a joke that only they find funny, mm -hmm. but are ball over with laughter and can't, like, uh, I, well, I won't get into it, but have, I feel that way. Have you ever way. seen the, the Lub Lubitsch picture, To Be or Not To Be? Yes. With Jack Benny. So yes. they call me concentration camp air. That's very <laughs> funny. Anyway. We'll no. Uh, uh, the, the, but I was going to say, The See You Next Wednesday comes from 2001. It's a line of dialogue. It's, it's a line of dialogue with a family at it's home. It's not in all my movies. I know. Okay. I know. I'm not going to bore you with this. Thank you. <laughs> um, what I'm curious about is, initially, was it sort of a lark that became a thing? No, it's a script. It's the title of a screenplay I wrote when I was seven, 16 or 17. Before you went to Yugoslavia. Before I went to Yugoslavia, when I was a mailboy. And mm -hmm. uh, it's the title of a screenplay I wrote that will never get made, but whenever I steal from it, or use a gag or take something from that script, I give it a credit. In the movie. You make sure that the title is mentioned. It gets a credit, usually in a poster or something. But it's only in like eight or nine movies. It's not in most of my movies. And, and I, it, it's the kind of thing where you realize what the internet has done. Well, I'll tell you though, this is prior to the internet. You know. I will have you know that yes. I noticed it on my own and then I looked it. I was like, am I seeing this every time? Or is it, and then I looked it up. Well, I feel stupid about it because when people ask me, you can tell they're disappointed by the answer because it's like. Are some people? Uh, I like it. It's a little wink. Are some people surprised that that, that there's no connection to see you next Tuesday? Is my well, I didn't know that <laughs> see you next Tuesday is a British expression. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, when I made when I I wrote an American Werewolf in London in Yugoslavia in 1969, and the first time I was in London was 69, and again when I went back in 75 as a writer for The Spy Who Loved Me. Mm. I worked a long time with Anthony Burgess on that. Um, wow. For Guy Hamilton, none of us, by the way, <laughs> ended up working on the movie, but Cubby Broccoli was nice to me. But I, there used to be cartoon cinemas, they were called, in London. The Eros and Piccadilly Circus, which is in the film, one in Leicester Square, one in Victoria Station, one in Marble Arch, and they were like what's called the high street, mm, the shopping yeah. street. So parents would drop their kids off at the cartoon cinemas and then go shopping. And there were like kids and old drunks getting warm. And 
I love them because they showed, remember this is 69, 75, before home video. And they showed beautiful prints of Tex Avery and Chuck Jones and Fris Freeling, you know, Bob Clampett, all the great cartoon directors, wonderful stuff. And so I'd go to the cartoon cinemas and they all thought it was crazy. But anyway, so when I, it, it, the script, it's written, it's, it's a Roadrunner cartoon right. that's on screen during that. When I, in 1981, when I finally got the money to make the movie, it, it was a porno theater. Right. <laughs> so it actually, I think, probably works better that way. So I got to shoot my lone little British, you know, oops, my knickers are showing porno. And what was weird was <laughs> I called it See Next Wednesday, and all the English people were like, I see what he did. He made it the next yeah. day. <laughs> and they thought it was like, and I had no idea what they were talking about. That's so, no, good. that was not, that's not what it is. <laughs> Uh, after Amer an American, I didn't know you, that you wrote, God, the American Werewolf in London, you wrote when you were 17, 18 years old. That's, 18. That's a It got me a, and you know, the movie I made was 99%. It didn't change much, which is a part of its charm, I guess. But it's, what's interesting about that is, uh, it, it just, so P I always tell writers, you know, I wrote that in 69 and made it in 81. Yeah. And it, except for the porno theater, that's the only change. That's it. It was because it was too weird for people, and it got me a lot of work as a writer. Sure. But no one would buy it or make it. Right. And it also helped that the technology had advanced with your friend Rick Baker to the No, point. he had a long time to think about it, but he figured it out. I gave him that script on Schlock, and he figured it out within a couple of years. It just right. took a long time to get And then, actually... Then Howling came well, along. No, what happened was that Rick had an assistant named Rob Botine, who's right. brilliant. Rob did... Uh, the thing for John Carpenter, and he did some brilliant with RoboCop, and he just did a lot of great work. And I met Rob when he was 15 and living in Rick's garage, mm -hmm. run away from home. And so when I finally got the money, because I had made three movies in a row that made money, right. and I finally could do American Werewolf, which was, by the way, made negative, it was negative pickup, it's completely independent. Right. Um, I call Rick and I go, hey, we're doing, you know, and Rick goes, oh. I'm already doing it I'm for doing somebody else. I'm doing a movie else. for Joe Dante called The Howling. So, so it's kind of a werewolf movie. I said, well, you didn't show him the change heads and stuff. Well, I kind of did. Yeah. You <laughs> motherfucker! I mean, you know, like, there's a Jerry Lewis movie called The Errand Boy. Sure. Where his boss screams at him so hard, they cut to Jerry, and his eyebrows are like, <laughs> on his forehead. I mean, that was me with uh, Rick. Yeah. I was so upset. So Rick, left Rob to do the howling, and then he came and did Werewolf. That right. prick. Well, still. That's still like he's won, I think, seven Oscars since then. Yes, needless to say, and the same hairdo. But here's the thing. Uh, we got your naked Naughton. We got the importance of being Britain. Um, and dealing with Colonel Tom Parker. These are my oh, interests, yeah, really. uh, my, my points of interest. You wanted to use all these great uh, songs. I got most of you them. You got a shit ton of great and hysterical the way you use them. You come across one version of Elvis recording. No, there were three songs I didn't get. Right. One was Moonshadow by Cat Stevens, right. which I wanted to use in the opening, which is a lovely song about dismemberment. Exactly. <laughs> and Cat. Uh, had already... Well, now people know this, but Cat is named Yusef Islam, mm -hmm. and he's Muslim, and, and uh, at that time, he didn't want to sell his music. Now he sells his music for Volkswagen commercials. I was like, oh, yeah. I'm calling Al-Qaeda. <laughs> anyway, but so he didn't let me use it. Do and, you have their number? Yeah. Okay. What? Um, <laughs> and then... Uh, the other song. The other song. We're represented by the same age. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, but then the other song was uh, a wonderful version of Bob Blue, Dylan. Blue Moon by Bob Dylan. Right. And at that point in time, Bob was a, uh, you know, a Christian. He was a Christian for like 30 minutes. He really was. Yeah, and then he became a born-again Jew again. Uh -huh. Now he's on the Chabad telethon. Right, My course. favorite thing is like... <laughs> Chabad Telegon is like, it's not time for the Shanda for the Goyam show. You know? <laughs> anyway, um, so, so then, uh, then comes... Colonel Tom with Elvis. Well, Elvis, on his first album, does a beautiful version that's very ethereal and mostly yodeling. And it's really quite nice. And Colonel Parker. Anyway, dealing with him was interesting. I didn't get it. Uh, give me nine seconds of the interesting aspect of dealing with Colonel Because, Tom. you know, he was just a complete crook. And he would, he would say yes for this price. And then it would be, it's like buying a house from, you know, one of the Persian real estate guys in Beverly Hills. It's like, you know, but you said it was one of those. 
It was very difficult. <laughs> it's, you learn what the term Byzantine means. Yeah. I can't sell you that for 20000 It's 40000 Why would I give it to you for sixty? And then he never intended to. You realize with Colonel Parker, he, he never intended to. Right. And you also realize that, you know, he, the reason Elvis never performed in Europe, he was offered millions, was because Colonel Parker was didn't here. Didn't want to travel. He was here illegally. Yeah. Didn't have a visa, didn't couldn't have, leave the country. Didn't have a passport. Right. He was not a citizen. Uh, he was yeah. Dutch. I always found that to be astonishing as well. Uh, the Naked Naughton will, will, oh, okay, so. The Naked Naughton. Uh, American Werewolf comes out, and you get this phone call from Michael Jackson, and I love the fact that when you go to CBS, the record label, to shoot this, uh, what would become historical 14 minutes and change, their attitude is, forget it, it's never going to happen. The well, yeah, right? it was Sony and CBS, yeah, they... You have to when when Michael called me for Thriller, I've said this so many times. But Thriller had already been the bit, best-selling album of all time for and quite had, a long and time, and been out over a year. Exactly, um, where it rested, by the way, on the top ten, if not forever. Yeah, and then it was number one was number, for a year, and now it's like number four or something. It had dropped to four, and they were like, "We're not going to spend any money now." Well, it's on its way out. Well, also because. A so-called rock video at that time would cost thirty to fifty thousand right. dollars, and when Mike came to me, I wanted to exploit his celebrity to do a theatrical short. I mean, that was why it's fifteen minutes because what I wanted to do was the have old two reeler, exactly, and uh, which is what my deal was and what we made. And so when Michael called Walter Yetnikoff, he was not amused, and and that's why uh, we made it ourselves. Basically, it's a vanity video, right? But the making of also. Well, that was George Fuller. So, okay, it's going to be a union shoot. I want the dancers to have 10 days rehearsal. One of the reasons it's good is because it's a movie. You yeah. know, when they do rock videos, they don't get rehearsals and stuff. Right. You know, I mean, I wanted rehearsals. I wanted their union dancers, union crew, union makeup guys. And it was like a little, it was a shoot. It was big. So it was half a million dollars, we figured, to work on it. It was actually like 480000 when it came down to it. Like, right. oh, 20000 lunch, you know. <laughs> but... So what we did was, uh, George, I said, where are we going to get the money? And, and Michael goes, well, I'll pay for it. And he was living with his parents in Encino behind Gelson's there. I said, no, you, you're not going to pay for it. So George Folsey Jr., or George, now he's George Folsey, um, he suggested uh, that we shoot us shooting it and make a 45-minute making of Thriller that with that 15-minute Thriller would be an hour, and we could sell that cable TV was brand new and Showtime HBO turned us down sure and Showtime which had like 200,000 subscribers they gave us quarter of a million dollars for the first the right for the first five days to show it thriller to make it for five days at which point Bob Bittman calls up hysterical uh, from MTV saying you know why we said and you're on free cable you have you know like 10 million people so we said uh, Okay, you want to be next? You pay us. And we got the other 200. You know, now MTV claims they made it. You know, right. right, yeah. They gave us money so they could show it. But my deal with Mike was a theatrical release. Disney released it with Fantasia here. And it did so well that CBS basically fucked me. And, uh, I mean, we could have made a lot more money. By the way, that lawsuit still goes on. But um, Thank goodness. But uh, we ended up... The bottom line is that they, 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 it went on Showtime, then it went on MTV, and for a while MTV showed it like nine times a day. It revolutionized the network. And when MTV's... I remember them showing it nine times a day because all my sisters had to do was say, go away, and I would run in terror and cry <laughs> and cry and cry I'm in sorry. the fetal position. But it's they, true. They it's would, true. It's true. They would, uh, when MTV's window was up... Yeah. Um, Michael's manager at that time was Frank DeLeo. Oh, boy. Who of all the pe I got to tell you, all the people I dealt with, he seemed to be the only, him and Bill Bray were the only two guys who cared about Michael Jackson. Mm. All the other guys were like, you know, just. He's an ATM. Yep. Yeah. Um, but uh, Frank DeLeo, who, by the way, this guy's, he's Nashville now. He's got a little ponytail. He's in Goodfellas as one of the crew. Yes. Because. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's what he looks like. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Frank is the one I learned 20 years later who went and basically duped 100,000 of Thriller, not of the making of Thriller, because that I own, he couldn't do that, but of Thriller, and sent it free to every television station in the world. Oh, my God. 
And so by doing that, what happened was Thriller, the album, tripled its sales. Exactly. And the other side effect that's so interesting is a guy named Austin First. I have no idea what happened to him from Texas, called me. These are the early days of home video. And you remember a, a videotape was like $80 to $100 to buy, which is why the rental business started. And he said, would you put out, can you sell me the rights to put out Thriller and the making of Thriller on a VHS and a, you know, a beta? And I said, who would pay $100? And he said, no, we're going to sell through. I never heard that. And he saw, I think it was $24 or something. They sold millions. <laughs> Needless to say. So it created that business. I mean, it, it, it had huge impact, and it was nobody's good idea. It was just Michael wanting to turn into a monster. Yeah, he just called you and said, I want to turn into a monster. And yeah, he was all... lovely and, and brilliant, and it was, that was a great experience. And for you to be able to... Except for getting screwed later. <laughs> well, but, but for you to be able to have this uh, moment in time with the Blues Brothers where you, you have these dance numbers and these big, big scenes that's almost an homage to uh, the great musicals. Well, the Blues Brothers, because John and Danny were not real dancers, I used amateurs when we were in Chicago. Right, but you got a taste of it. So the idea well, here no, was I, Listen, my wife thinks I'm gay. I love musicals. I mean, you put on Fred and Ginger, I, I'm happy. I mean, right. You know, and... Well, uh, clearly. Singing in the Rain. I love musicals. Right. And so you've been dying to do this. Well, what happened was on the Blues Brothers, only one number, which was James Brown, did I have professional dancers because we got back to L.A. and I saw the dailies. And I went, oh, I need professional dancers. <laughs> so, um... For me, Thriller was an opportunity to do a dance number right. Right. You know, and not as a joke. Right. And uh, so, how thrilling does it end it was up great. being? It was when you're actually in the moment doing it. Well, you're working. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can't be too thrilled. I mean, sometimes when you're working with, I was, I mean, Michael was so gigantic at that time. He would. It, I, but he went from gigantic to the the Lord. Well, yes, but after he. I, but what was interesting was when we made Thriller. Um, it was like working with Christ, <laughs> in the, because people would see him and faint. Yes. Yeah, boom. Or they would start sobbing hysterically. Or they would. It, it was incredible. And also his friends or who he knew, Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire came to the set. Uh, you know, Michael. It's a call from Lillian Disney. It was like you know he used to get <laughs> the wackiest. You know, the, my favorite. I've told this story too many times, but the only time in my life. I've ever been speechless was shooting Thriller, 4 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, downtown L.A. in Vernon, meatpacking place, a dangerous neighborhood, a lot of cops. And, stuff. and Michael's assistant comes to me and says, Michael would like to see you. And I said, well, tell him I'll be there in 15 minutes. And he's in his Winnebago, you know, the railroad track. Mm -hmm. So 15 minutes later, I go out and I knock on the door and I, you know, I step up into a Winnebago. Sure. As I get in like this, Michael says, John, do you know Mrs. Onassis? Oh. <laughs> it was Jackie Kennedy. And she's wearing pearls. You know, it was like, <laughs> it was Jackie. It was Jackie. It was like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was lovely, by the way. But um, it, she actually said, I love the way those people spoke in trading places. Oh, my God. She did. She, did. she said that? Yeah. I just love. Like and did she say, how did you get Jamie Lee to show her boobies? <laughs> no, ja actually, Jackie Kennedy. No. <laughs> no, she was very nice. And, I, you know, she, she did a book with Michael later. That, you right. know, she, but that, I, I remember that. That was just bizarre. Yeah. yeah but yeah. he used to have extraordinary people. Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando. You know, hanging, couldn't get him away from craft service. People, <laughs> people would show up. It was wild. Yeah. So uh, in terms of a moment in time, the effect that it had on MTV, the effect that it had on, the, well, tru the truth is the like making of. International. Yeah. It was amazing. The, the making of, which I love that you, at one point you were calling it... Um, we were calling it the making of filler. filler. Yeah, the making of filler, because it was be... anything to fill out 45 minutes. It turned out well, but there was stuff in that movie, like you see part of American Werewolf, because I own it. Right. You see one of the old clips they had from concerts, because they owned it. Right. That 8 millimeter footage of Michael dancing, which we've now seen ad nauseum, but I found it in their closet. You know, we were literally trying to find anything. And one of the things we did, out of desperation, that actually is kind of cool you know, was shooting Rick Baker, explaining what he's doing. Yes. Then cutting to, so you, Rick explains it, then we cut back to Thriller, which you've just seen. I think there's probably eight minutes of Thriller in the making of Thriller. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, there is. Yeah, it was just, we were desperate. Well, listen, 
the amazing part of that is it goes on to basically uh, revolutionize the making of as a thing. Yeah, it became you know, an industry. It, it, absolutely industry. And now with the DVDs, that's all we want is the, is the making of and the back and the behind the scenes and the extras and the extras and the extras. If you think about it, it's utterly one it completely yeah, I informed guess. the I other. Don't know. I don't know. It, it, Michael was... Uh, Not to mention what it did for MTV. No, it made MTV. The fact that they were complaining at all about... I think it's funny that MTV doesn't show videos anymore. No, they just had to relaunch an aspect of MTV2, yeah. which was the only thing left over. And Phil even Ro that, you know Phil Rosenthal? Sure. Phil Rosenthal, he just went to pitch an idea to the Food Network, and they actually said to him, we're getting away from food. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Cartoon Network. He's no longer doing cartoons. So you're like, what the? <laughs> yeah. Madness, man. I feel like Chuck Heston. You know? It's you a seen, bad house. Have you seen these videos online of, like, uh, prisoners in Thailand, like an entire prison population? The, the, doing... the thriller dance. Yeah. And I'm not sure why. I think partly because the dance is not that hard to do. <laughs> you know, this. But the, but, but the thriller dance before the Thai prisoners. Uh-huh. It, it's a phenomenon where Pete, as before Michael passed away, now it's even bigger. It's yeah. interesting. Michael's, a, you know, it's like Elvis. They right. became superstars once they, I mean, they were always superstars, but they became supernovas, you know, once they died. Um, it's like John Hughes. Mm -hmm. I mean, John's my age, and, he, you know, he died and he was a genius. Right. <laughs> I was thinking, hmm, my pictures are classics and mm -hmm. I'm 60. <laughs> you gotta go. I gotta die. <laughs> <laughs> you have to vanish at I least. I gotta die. I'll make some more, but. Yeah. Anyway, but. Um, the exciting story I'm telling you Thriller is, dance. Thriller dance. People do it. It became a phenomenon at bar mitzvah parties. Yeah. Sure. Weddings. Quince años. Just the weird... I have a wonderful thing someone bought me in Mexico of, you know, the Day of the Dead stuff? Sure. They bought it quite a while ago. It was before Michael passed. But it's Day of the Dead, but Thriller. <laughs> With Michael and all the skeletons dancing and stuff. Nice. It's very cool. But anyway, it, it's, it's, that is an amazing... Go Google Thriller dance. Yeah. The, the, I think at the moment the highest number of people is fifty or sixty thousand in Mexico City. Oh my God! Doing the Thriller dance at any one at any yeah, one time. At any one time. Yeah. Oh my God! It's I, bizarre. Uh, I love the uh, aspect of the Thriller for you was a couple things. Got to give Mike Michael some balls, and also going to him and saying, you know, when you say I'm not like other guys, it's a laugh line. No, I just wanted him to know that, uh, and he, I explained it to him, and he said, okay, he was fine with it. He was wonderful to work right. with on Thriller. And I'd give him balls. I mean, it was to make him more virile. That's why there's a girl in it. Right. You know, because he never, in the first, in Billy Jean and Beat It, he's with boys in one, and then in the other, he's with a girl, but she's unconscious on the bed. You know, I wanted him to relate to a human female. Right. Which he did great. And you, know? you end up casting a playmate. Well, I didn't know but you she didn't was a, realize it at the time. Playmate. You yeah. find out you have to go to Michael and say, "Is this okay?" It was a problem because Michael's grandfather, Catherine's father, was a, a I don't know if they call him deacons or whatever. They, he was a high up in the Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Witness, and the church had a problem with Thriller actually, but with a, with a playmate. And I said, Mike, you know, tell them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> you know, and Michael goes, "Oh, John, you know, he'd get a, he'd always he'd be." You just, talk about an odd phenomenon. Jehovah Witness problem with the uh, well, that's why they have thriller that. video is the reason for the disclaimer. Well, and you said yourself the disclaimer, by the way, is one of the reasons that a bit of a controversy was started Michael, and more interest was created. I have to say, I, I wrote the disclaimer. That was a deal. I wrote that and said, Michael, sign this. Okay. You know, but what was, yeah, Michael had a genius for controversy and publicity. When we were doing black and white, mm -hmm. uh, one of the PAs had fallen, oh, what's it called where you do the the, the worm thing? No, no, bike, the, the bicycles where you go up. A half the, pipe. Or a ramp? Yeah, but what, you know, that's called something, that sport. BMX. What, BMX. BMX, that, you know, the bicycle stuff with the pools. Mm -hmm. And the guy had fallen and sprained his arm and wrecked his arm and on his, his right arm, he had this bandage that was like laced up and this thing like that. And Michael said, oh, what's that? And he said, well, I hurt my arm. Can I have it? <laughs> the guy goes, what? He says, can I have it? He goes, Oh, he takes it off. And Michael puts it on. John, I want to wear this in the in the in the. Fine, you know. And what was interesting is, <laughs> they start selling them, and they start. It became a fashion thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was extraordinary, you know. In I that mean, regard, no just no you know, about it. amazing. Yeah. Uh, 
I, uh, so how did uh, how did the Let's Show Jamie Lee's boobies work, by the way? <laughs> it's in the script, you know. Uh-huh. I, well, I know it's in the script, but here's an actress who, at that point, um, you know, they, well, first of it's all, a bit of a coming out party, if you will. Steve Martin did his review, I, I can't do it like Steve, but his review of Trading Places, he said he wanted, he wanted to do it for me. So his review was this. Wow. <laughs> Not a fan of the film? Uh, he liked it when Jamie took her shirt off. Um, no, Jamie at that time had only done horror films. Exactly. And, in fact, the studio was very upset with me for casting. And, uh, no, she read it and saw that... You saw some of the studios didn't. Well, that she was smart and funny and could play... I mean, the, the character of Ophelia in Trading Places is inexcusable. It is the classic hooker with a heart of gold... And in the plot, she, you know, helps him, loans him money, falls in love. In real life, oh, yeah, well, please. this doesn't happen. Please. And, you know, the hooker with a heart of gold from Jane Fonda and Clute and Shirley MacLaine. And, pretty woman. And, and, you know, and pretty woman. I mean, these, these you know, this is a, a male fantasy. And it was the only thing in the movie that bothered me. And I, want, I didn't want to hire a, a, a traditional pretty starlet and Jamie I I'd, I'd met doing the silly documentary on horror films and because she was a scream queen and she was so funny and had that angular she was interesting and I said you know she projects intelligence and she'd always played victims you know and so um Barry Diller was upset he said she's a scream queen be picture uh I think no it she, was bold it was well, she was one bold. she's wonderful in the movie well you know that well hello that's my job yeah. you know and I and they didn't want Danny Aykroyd either Really? They were very upset that I cast Danny because John had died, and Dan did a film called Dr. Detroit, right. which tanked. So the conventional wisdom was, was like after Martin and Lewis broke up. Everyone said, poor Dean, poor what's going to happen to Dean? You know? And Aykroyd, I, may, I think, is brilliant. Absolutely. And I know, you know, people never credit Danny. It's kind of sad when they talk about stuff. You know, look at Danny in Trading Pla Lewis Winthorpe the third. Danny's unbelievable. Look at Elwood. Please. Look at uh, the guy he Danny played Danny was never in, a straight uh, man. He was Driving Miss Daisy. Yeah. And look at the guy in Ghostbusters. They're completely different planets. I mean, you know, he's a fine actor. And I knew Lewis Winthorpe the third is essentially an asshole. And I knew that Danny would have the courage to, you know, at the end of the movie, he's the same asshole. He's just, he's enlightened. Right. But he hasn't, you know, he's the same tight-ass guy he was. And right. I knew that he'd have the courage to play it. Right. And, uh, and he did. And he's wonderful. He really is. It's, it, that's my the, one of the great cast, Denim Elliott and uh, Don Amici and Ralph Bellamy. Oh, such a mm. pleasure. I just, talk about Ralph Bellamy, what a career. Yeah. You ask him about, you know, Leo McCary and Howard Hawks and what was it like being in the Wolfman, you know? I mean, <laughs> Ralph Bellamy. You're the bad guy in Rosemary's Baby, you know. You're yeah. the bad guy in The Professionals, you know. You're Franklin D. Rose. I mean, Ralph Bellamy was, he was also such a lovely guy. Yeah. Wonderful man. Johnny. He was the only one who could call me Johnny. That you would allow. Yeah. Well, a couple more questions, Johnny, and then I'll drive you home. <laughs> See what happened? Uh, <laughs> I, we have fans here, so we have to talk about spies like us. Sp that's a period picture now. It is. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That deals with the Soviets, the Soviet Union, and yeah. Bob Hope's last film. And, but, I mean, the whole structure of that movie. And the weirdest thing of all about that picture, it, which is another Danny Aykroyd picture, you know, that he wrote, really, and is that Afghanistan, Pakistan. And in it, they meet the Mujahideen, who were our allies at mm. that time. We were <laughs> arming them to fight the Soviets and then eventually to sh kill us. But yes. But it's, it's kind of a... That's the only movie I ever made I, I had to do a, like, we changed the ending. It Based ended, on testing? Yeah, or? it ended with the end of the world. It ended with, they all go in those tents and, then you know, and the audience didn't like that. They didn't care for that? No. <laughs> Even though it was a farce? They didn't like it. They went, we want them to live. Well, I so think I that just... means you succeeded on one emotional <laughs> level, though, as a, as a storyteller. Yeah. But, gee, Stanley got to do it in Dr. Strangelove. You well. Chuck Heston got to do it in the second Planet of the Apes movie. I mean, That's right. Gee. <laughs> no, I, it was darker, and they didn't like it, so we shot that silly insert of, on a soundstage in Burbank, you know, to, three months later. Right. Did you ever see William Friedkin's To Live and Die in L.A.? Yeah, it's wonderful. Wonderful. 
the same thing. The, it tested so poorly. The audience went, you can't kill him, you can't kill him. And they forced him to go back and reshoot a little ending where it's William Peterson <laughs> and it's his partner and he's like bringing him like Coco and he's in bed in the cabin in the woods or something and he's got like, he's got like a bandage around him. He got a shotgun to the chest, like two feet away. Oh, he's fine. He's fine. You and then know, Friedkin fought them on it and mercifully they released it where he dies. It's, it's, it's a very difficult thing because, I mean, the most famous one of those is Fatal Attraction, mm -hmm. where in yeah. the original script, uh, Glenn Close, he kills, he drowns her, but she set it up so the police are coming. He, she basically framed him for her murder which is a great ending and the one he deserves, but it tested so badly that if you remember the movie, not only did they rip off Diabolique, <laughs> but they, the audience demanded that the wife kill her. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. I mean, and that was the com commercially the correct decision. And I, it's hard, you know. I be, look, after uh, I was so upset with my fighting with the studio on Blues Brothers 2000 with what they did to that, I was so mad, I said, to this guy, get me a million dollars and I'm gonna make a feature. And so they got me a million dollars and I made a movie called No One's Seen called Susan's Plan with uh, Nastasia Kinski, Kinski, Dan Aykroyd, Rob Schneider, Michael Bean, Billy Zane, Laura Flynn Boyle, uh, Bill Dukes, got a great cast. Mm. Um, and I shot this thing in eight, six days, seven days. I mean, really ridiculous, low budget, and it was hard. <laughs> but it, it was about bad people doing bad things, and at the end they all get caught, caught and punished. <laughs> and you know, they end up in jail or killed or whatever. And everyone who read it said, oh, the ending's terrible. And I said, but, you know. And I said, fuck it, it's a million dollars, you know what? And then when I, <laughs> we previewed that the audience went, oh, Jesus, we liked it until, <laughs> and, and by the way, the guys who put up the money ended up selling it to Showtime. There was a lot of sex in it. So they sold it to Showtime as one of those Skinamax movies. Did they really? And it disappeared. It was like it was like making a film that just, and then and then uh, what's it called? Blockbuster. Somebody said, "I saw your picture that uh, dying to get rich." I said, "I never made a movie called." Yeah, you did. It was it was Susan's, Susan's plan. Susan's plan. You changed the title. Some of some bitches. Well, this brings us to a question from our audience. Yes. From our live audience that happens to be watching. And the one of which uh, feeds right into this. To what extent has filmmaking changed since you began in the business? And then specifically, can a film get made because a creative person has a great idea that they're passionate about, or is it now completely research and demographic driven? Well, there's no clean answer to any of that. First of all, filmmaking itself hasn't changed since 1900. Nor will it. Yeah, it's the technology changes. Yeah, that's right. But if you look at a production still from 1907 and a production still from 2011, there's a recording device with actors in front of it and crew behind it. I mean, you know, the montage, filmmaking has not changed. Tools change. Filmmaking hasn't changed. The industry has changed tremendously. It's it and and it's kind of in a state of flux and. The answer is if someone has a good idea, well, everyone thinks they have a good idea. That's a problem. And My, the guy that cleans the pool actually has a great screenplay. Everybody does, and it's and it's it's complicated. There's no simple answer to that, and I don't want to vilify as much as I'd like to. I don't want to vilify the studios or something because it's different now. Uh, you know, they wouldn't hire. I mean, the, I'm not the guy they're going to hire to do uh, Transformers or Spider-Man 11 or something because, you know, I have ideas that, you know, I mean... You had a meeting a few years back, I read, where they said, are you going to make the movie? Well, hire you, John, but are you going to make the movie? No, what, it, was, it was, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That was, the head of a studio said to me, the reason we're not hiring you is we're just afraid that, you know, you'll go make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> what does that fucking mean? Well, I realized what they meant. Well, I real what they meant was they. It's committee stuff now, and right. it really is. You're working. You know, if you're making one of these Marvel pictures, it's not a director's issue. Is the tale though that's wagging? Did you see Kenneth Branagh's Thor? Oh God. Excuse me. I mean, I can't blame Kenneth Branagh for that. Right. I mean, he's lucky he survived. You know, I mean, I guess. Uh, I, well, I, uh, you, yeah. It's a corporate. It's a different. It's different. It, By the way, good movies are made, and what was that really good? Social Network. I mean, good movies are made and will continue to be made, but it's all in flux now. Yeah. Everything, nobody knows what's going to happen, and it's all kind of in flux, and the reason they're making these superhero movies and, and toy movies and remakes and sequels, I have... People object to remakes and sequels. They've always it's, been. Like, it's always been. Right? The Maltese Falcon is a remake. The Wizard of Oz is a remake. Star is Born is a remake. 
and recent one, John Carpenter's The Thing is a remake. They're both great movies. Mm -hmm. The Fly, David Cronenberg, great movies, you know. Because um, I was given a lot of shit when I, I sold the option to remake an American Werewolf to Dimension. So many people gave me grief. And I said, look, if they do a, maybe someone will do a great job and it'll be great. And then they'll make more and I'll make even more money. And then if they do a terrible job, I look like a genius. You know, I, it's, a, it's a no lose for me. It really is. But the, it's about marketing. Right. It's so costly to market a movie. But marketing's been the tale that's wagged the dog now for years. Yeah, it's, dang, it's scary. It Really, Four Weddings and a Funeral was the first one where they spent so much money. They spent like $45 million to sell a $5 million movie. Right. And, uh, and guess what? It Unfor worked. Unfortunately, it worked. Oh, sure. And now when you open... you Listen, you know, if you're a major and you make a picture, it, you're opening it in Bangkok and Bangladesh and San Francisco and Pittsburgh and Odessa and Barcelona and London at the same time. Right. You know, so... And it's funny when people get upset because they're still happy to see the new James Bond. That's right. You know, so it just... I, listen... I think the Harry Potter thing, I, I enjoy those movies, and I, and I think they've done an amazing job. Right. And it doesn't, I don't know. You I, don't have to make shit just because it's a giant studio and they're spending a fortune on money. Yeah, I, it's hard for me to criticize the majors even though I want to. <laughs> but it's hard because they, everything's, it's corporate, it's different. When I made Animal House, I could tell you Lou Wasserman ran Universal, Charlie Bluthorn ran Paramount, Steve Ross ran Warner Brothers, Arthur Krim ran United, United Artists. I mean, Lou Grade was ITC. I could tell you whose company it was. You can't do that now. No. It's all layers and layers and layers and layers, and, and it's, it's different. What do you think about the comeback of the R-rated comedy? Because that was all the rage when you were making comedies. They were all R-rated. And then there was this drop-off for 15. Everything goes in cycles. Right. I mean, but it's it, the history of the business. Movies are only like a hundred years, hundred something years old. Right. Hollywood from the, if you start like 1925, how many years? It's not that much. So like every decade, there are, there are big A quality horror pictures and then mostly B pictures. And then every decade there are big musicals and then no musicals. And then there's, you know, every genre goes up and down. It's basically every decade. And uh, now the, the, big, the biggest change in movies is uh, because of Lucas and Spielberg that we now make B pictures with gigantic budgets. Mm. And it used to be no self-respecting actor wanted to play a superhero because look what it did to George Reeves. They cut him out of t From Here to Eternity. Did you know that? No. Because he, he had a big role and then at the preview, it's Superman! And they had to cut him out. Cut him out. Right. And ruined his career. And now everybody wants to be a superhero because there's not much else to do. <laughs> Well, there you have it. It can make your career, or it, oh, can, absolutely. or it can destroy it. Listen, Sean Connery, someone who, you know, he was the he was the bad guy in a Tarzan movie before he made yeah. James Bond. And what's fascinating is his career choices after that. He made some great movies, you know. Two uh, gals watching want to ask uh, Elaine and Renee want to ask about um, Griffin Dunn's skin flap. Yeah, people get fascinated. That they was, really do. That was uh, Rick Baker. He did the makeup. Sure. And what happened was um, when he was painting him, you know, he would He go, too, by the way, got to wear the gorilla suit. We saw you at the opening in Schlock. He got to wear, of course, the gorilla suit in the remake of King Kong, right? Oh, Rick was a, Rick was a gorilla in a lot of movies. <laughs> well, let's name a few, shall we? Uh, he's the two-headed gorilla in The Incredible Two-Headed Transplant. He's a gorilla named Sidney, named after Sid Sheinberg in The uh, Incredible Shrinking Woman. Who's the grill in Trading Places? Some other guy. Because Rick, <laughs> oh. Rick by that time was unavailable. You had to get Jim Baker. <laughs> no, he, I'm trying to think who it was. It was, it was someone else. And then, uh, but I'm trying to think. Rick was, he was a gorilla in, a, in Kentucky Fried Movie. He's Dino. Go. But he was King Kong. So he gives you the skin flap. Well, he did the makeup. And then while he was thinking, when it got wet, and Griffin, I saw that it was doing that. I said, just leave it wet. Rick went, oh, but look. <laughs> and people are fascinated by that. By the skin flap. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are, sir. Uh, one of the fun things we hope on this show uh, is a, a rapid-fire form of questions we call Tweet 5 uh, with a Dave Keckner uh, graphic. T5, T5 forever now. He's a funny son of a bitch. That must have cost a fortune. It really did. Uh, well, these wow. are from the audience, written specifically for you. They are five questions, and they are Coke or Pepsi, this or that, no correct answer styled questions. Five of them, rapid fire, ready? 
This would be the Elaine Ewing skin flap edition. <laughs> intentional or not? Well, we just found out. Intentional. Well, uh, yes and no, because Rick carved it that way, but we discovered when it was wet, it would flap. So it was an accident that became intentional. Love that. <laughs> so both. Uh, kept at your house or Dunn's? Which? The skin flap. This is a skin flap edition. Well, you know, don't laugh. Griffin has terrible skin. No, don't worry. It's a, it's a, it was a foam appliance. And I, that answers the next question. Edible or rubber? Foam appliance. Uh, scary or funny five rotting flesh fan or foe? What? Oh, scary, I see. Scary or funny? The, the flap. Scary or funny to you? Both. Both. Yeah, right? Gotta be. And then the final one, rotting flesh fan or foe? Are you, in fact, a fan of, of rotting, flesh? <laughs> rotting flesh? You know, truthfully, somebody asked me once about, is something going too far? Can you not do that? In context, mm -hmm. you can do anything in context if it, you know, there are no rules. Right. It just it works or it doesn't work, and it's in context. Now, there you go. There's, a, there's the, the straightforward answer. Uh, this, well, this tweet five comes from David Udovan. Uh, You're making these names no, up. No, no, these you are. Udovan? <laughs> Udovan. Did you dive in or not? Udovan. <laughs> oh, son of a bitch. Lobster or crack crab? These are all for you specifically. I'm allergic to crustaceans. Well, maybe that's why they asked. Do you know? Do you know? What Here, the hell? Here's, here's a Telly Savalas joke. Question? Here's a Telly Savalas joke. All right. What is Toshiro? <laughs> this is bad. What is Toshiro Mifuni mm -hmm. having been run over by a truck mm -hmm. and a lobster have in common? They're both crustaceans. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awful. Uh, looking good or feeling good? Feeling good. Fat and drunk or drunk and stupid? <laughs> <laughs> that's no way to go through life. So. My Little Buttercup or Blue Shadows? Both Randy Newman songs. I think I like Blue Shadows better. Finally, do you mind if we dance with your dates? Uh, Okay, Capo, just so you are aware, that would be David Udovan. Thank you. Who was here in studio with me last week. That's oh, your I'm friend sure. David Udovan. Yeah, I did not know who's going to do that. Okay. Oh, I'm glad I mispronounced his name then. Me too. Um, <laughs> I read an interesting thing about uh, Can We Dance With Your Dates. The, the band, of course, made up of actors, the Otis. Uh, do you know the cool thing about the band? Please. There's two interesting things about the band. I know, one of these. One of them is that the uh, Otis Day was played by a wonderful actor from L.A. named Dwayne Jesse, who was in Bingo Long mm -hmm. and in Car Wash, a lot of movies. And he came up to Eugene and, we, you know, put a wig on. And uh, we, uh, an artist, a producer named Mark Davis from Motown, we recorded the music in L.A. And they lip-synced, so I had to hire the backup guy. It's a low-budget movie. Sure. Um, at that time in Eugene, Oregon, there were about 20 black people. Um, They're now 27. And so we tried to... Uh, we advertised in the school, University of Oregon paper, for African American men who could play instruments. And these guys came in. We conk their hair, and they're in the movie, and they're great. Many years later, you find out. Well, two things. One, people keep saying to me, "I saw Otis Day in the Nights, you know, last week. They're wonderful." I kept saying, uh, "They're fiction. And <laughs> these people are." Turns out, Dwayne. I learned this at the 25th anniversary. Dwayne changed his name to yep. Otis Day and yep. with his brothers and sisters has been performing as Otis Day in the Nights ever since. Yes. And two, the bass player in the band was a college student named Robert Cray. Who became? The was, is, and still remains Robert Cray. Yeah. The famous musician. So he owes his whole career to me. No, I'm just, yeah. I was so delighted. Like, really? <laughs> is that possible? Wait, yeah. can, can he do that legally? <laughs> Uh, the new Otis Day? Tour as the Otis Tour Day? Tour as a character that you created? You know, well, first of all, I didn't create him. But also, do you know, it's very interesting with stuff like that because there's a very successful pub in Greenwich Village in New York called The Slaughtered Lamb. Yeah. And I said to my lawyer, can he, it's been there like 30 years now. And I said, can they do that? Answer is yes. There's, uh, in Blues Brothers, Dan Aykroyd made up the name of a hair salon called Curl Up and Die. There are now, like, 200 in the United States. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, but they do that all the time, and you can't, it's not protected. It's, it's a but very... It's, it's intellectual property. How could it not be well, protected? Well, that's arguable. No, oh, that's <laughs> Tr truthfully, bad. it's not, pro it's not, it's, it's not, not did a... you know you can't protect a title? No, that, clearly not. That I did, yeah, you can't protect a song you, title you, or, or, a, or, or a film, film title. title. Yeah. Or my favorite... 
you know who Robert Benchley was? Sure. Benchley's first collection of, of essays that came out, uh, which I have a first edition, um, from The New Yorker, his for, in the, like, 1931 or something, is called David Copperfield or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Robert Benchley. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> because he found this out? I don't know, but he did that. Jaws or... He's also the one who, when he went to Venice, he sent Dorothy Parker a telegram that said, streets flooded, please advise. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, you're off the hook with these fine folks, it looks like, for now. Uh, I, a little bit more about the Three Amigos, if you wouldn't mind, just because such big fans here. Um, uh, I'll send you... Uh, please, please. There's a British film magazine called... Empire. Thank you. You're welcome. Called, eh, called Empire, <laughs> which is really good. Do you know there are no movie magazines left in the United States? Yeah, except right. horror. Right. You know. um, but Empire is a very good magazine, and two issues ago, they had this very nice spread where they called, <laughs> they had a reunion of, uh, in Santa Monica here, mm -hmm. of Chevy, Marty, and Steve, and me, and they shot them as the three amigos and we did an interview and it's quite funny i'll send it to you it's funny. where is this it's in a british film magazine and it will be on the dvd because i said to hbo do you know about this and they didn't so it's very funny it sounds wonderful yeah and the only one who wasn't there was well the only two were lauren and randy <clears throat> right they're they're too expensive so when you're doing the musical numbers yeah my little buttercup comes to mind uh tell me a little bit about that well, we hired a choreographer and told her what we wanted, and Marty and Steve rehearsed, and we did it. And just ridiculously fun. It is funny. Yeah. They're funny guys. <laughs> ridiculously. Like El Guapo said. You're funny, funny you guys. You are funny guys. <laughs> Only kill one of them. Only kill one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love when Steve, when Steve gets shot, and he goes, real bullets, oh great. He, he kind of walks up to them. If you watch, he's like walking like Hedy Lamar. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that, that what I like about that movie? It's just it's real silly, and I just like I really do like silly. You yeah, know, it's just me. But. No, it is really silly, and that's the the sort of pure sense of its humor. Now I want to ask you questions. Yes, please. Fine. Okay, I want to know what it was like being in Casino. Other than you were there for a long time. Can because I tell you how the, was Marty to work? Can I tell you the the, the shock? about working with him because he kn it's as if the composition of every scene if you look at a graph over the monitor he knows what he wants in every square inch of the graph okay and then within that composition that he's scrutinized and controlled every molecule the actors are as free as they've ever been in their entire lives to literally do whatever they want what about Within the, that completely what controlled about the script. Well, no, in terms of their interpretation. Mm. That is to say, um, I kept waiting for direction. I kept waiting for do it slower, faster, louder, softer. Nothing. Um, he would come, and there's a scene with me and Daenerys with this. He never gave you a direction? Well, here's the thing. You know that game that directors play, if they want you to do it uh, faster, they'll come over and say, so what do you think, faster, slower? Uh, knowing that whatever you choose, they're still gonna get to do it their way after you get done doing whatever you choose. I, no, I don't know that name. <laughs> well, I've, as an actor, been on the receiving end of really? it far too many times. Where you go, he wants me to do it faster. I don't know what he wants. I just know he's, he's giving the impression that I'm involved in the decision-making process. When in fact, the only reason I know this is that if I choose uh, slower, he'll come by and say, that was great, I like the slower. Let's try faster now. <laughs> right? So that's how you I'm learn. waste a lot of time. <laughs> they learn that I game. I just say faster. Yeah, well, there you go. So in the scene where De Niro and I were at the table there, and he's talking about the blueberries, you got more blueberries in your muffin mm -hmm. than me, and we took over to the kitchen. So we do a take, and then I just remember this bobbing Scorsese head at the end of the table, because he would come up to the table and he'd crouch down, just a little head. So what do you think? He should be more angry, less angry? What do you think? Is he, is he happy with the guy? And he would just literally was fascinated with actor's process. And what is it you want to well, try? How many takes? Well, that I was... Know, I know in De Niro, he does many, many takes. The two of them together love to do 30 to 35 takes in almost every setup. Doesn't that fry the other... When I saw the movie, I, by the way, I love Casino. I think it's brilliant. It's, it's better every time you see it. It's a brilliant film. I could tell that Rickles was burnt. 
that, you know, if that was just me knowing Don and had to work with him. But, you know, I could tell that this is a take where De Niro was brilliant and Don's exhausted. You know, he's an old man and it's take 41 or something. Yeah. Well, I you, mean, but, well, I mean, what would that do to the other actors? Well, for me, I can only speak, I hear myself acting after three takes anyways. If I ever am asked to do more than three takes, suddenly the spontaneity, the reality of the scene is completely gone, and now I'm just saying the same words over and over again. And I can change them, but I really just feel and sense myself acting as a, instead of just being, which is all I can ever bring to it. And here with De Niro, he would literally do something wildly different 35 times. And I thought, this is hell in editing. How do you cut all this together when it's ridiculous? Uh, in terms of the lack of continuity. From well, he covered it. I mean, he had... Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so, how you... But he's not giving you 35 of the same thing from every angle. It's literally... Oh, it's different every time? Well, that's how you cut it. You choose one. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, there you go. Uh, so for, for Rickles, it was a matter of him finding out that he owned De Niro, and then he would go after him in front of the others in the middle of a show. And make him collapse. He would turn on him in the middle of a scene while De Niro was talking and say, is that how you're going to do it, like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you got the awards. Go ahead. <laughs> and De Niro would... <laughs> he would cry like a nine-year-old. He was so happy. Uh, Pesci, not so much. <laughs> Pesci did not appreciate when Rickles pointed out that he was so short, he was going to ride him around the set like a Shetland pony. No. He said that in front of 200 people. And Pesci went, oh, yeah, you're a fucking riot, Rickles. No, no, I get it, I get it. I'm a midget and you're a genius. Go fuck that up. Uh, <laughs> what did Don say? Oh, he... He just went... Whoa. Well, the little guy doesn't like me. The little guy doesn't like me. <laughs> yeah. It's like that scene in Goodfellas. <laughs> yeah, what, am I a clown to you? <laughs> literally. Uh, so let, we've got to Rickles. Please, uh, the wonderful documentary, um, which I was surprised to find out uh, from the exhaustive research, no, during a t telephone call with you yesterday, you had so little time to shoot this over a couple of years. Right? Well, it wasn't that I had so little time to shoot it. It's you just, ended up only having some. I had no money, so it was um, it was something. I, it was a personal project. I wanted to make it for Don, and I felt, as I told you, I felt he wasn't getting the respect or attention he should be, and so I made this film, and it worked. It all turned out very well. Well, let me ask you because uh, being involved in stand-up comedy for most of my adult life, if not all of it. I can tell you that among his peers, there are very few people who have more respect. So you must mean from a mass audience, from a large audience. I was going to say, that's what you want, respect from stand-up comics. <laughs> well, They're the hardest audience to impress in the world. I know, and they the spend so much money. They are the ultimate consumer. <laughs> right. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite so things. So you felt his career no, 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 had, no, not no. Been had not been celebrated no. by the mass public. By the mass public, absolutely. Right. By the mass public. The, by the ultimate comics comic. It wasn't that so much. Is that Don is so unique. He doesn't do stand-up. He doesn't tell jokes. I've made the, the case that he's so unique that no one has actually tried to do a Rickles well, you, act since him. You can't really do it, because Fat Jack Leonard was an insult comic. Okay. Don is not an insult comic. He doesn't really insult people. He does, but... That's not if, just if, what he's doing. No, if you see his act, if you see... I mean, he's got a band, he sings and he dances. It's very old-fashioned, but what's extraordinary is it's the ambiance he creates where it doesn't matter. He makes a face and people are weeping with yeah. laughter. He's so fucking funny and I... And fast. His, and impro fast. his improvisation skills are the most underrated still, aspect. Still, yeah. still. And when you see, I mean like that footage I have in there from the uh, Reagan inauguration. Am mm, I going too fast for you, Ronnie? My favorite is he sees Billy Graham and he goes, he goes Billy Graham, my wrist is hurting. I mean, you know, I just, I... I just yeah. I adore him. The speed of his improvisational skills w were the greatest I've ever seen, and I've been on stage with Robin Williams improvising. Oh, but also the other thing about Rickles that's so interesting is nobody, people rarely get offended. I mean, certainly occasionally, but he's he's other than Pesci, I've only seen people want to oh, be. Oh, absolutely! It's Please an honor attack to be me. insulted by by him. And you saw that that footage of him going after Marty. Oh Marty's God. asthmatic. Yeah, he's gonna die. He couldn't breathe. I'm on the set when he says, "You didn't tell me the director was dying." <laughs> No, I was there. But it's, no, I, I was talking about Carson. There's a clip I have from him on, on, no, it's Leno. He's on Leno, and just, he goes after Marty. And you see that Marty's like, poor guy's going to die. Yeah. can't breathe. Yeah. But anyway, but the, uh, the so I've known Rickles since I was 
Kelly's, Kelly's hero. And I'm very fond of him. Did he remember you from that? Those oh, no, he's always... Oh, no, I've worked with Don a lot. He was in uh, that TV thing I told you about when Steve Martin produced. And I, right. he, he's wonderful in a movie I made called Innocent Blood that right. uh, is about vampires in the mafia. I made it in 1990. Um, I've worked with Don quite a bit, actually. And, and we've been friendly over all these years. Right, sure, sure. And so... to. For me, the documentary, it's one of the reasons he let me do it. You know, he, he kind of thought I was full of shit. Well, know? one of the things you said on the phone was that he was one of these acts from his era who said, you, you can't film my act. Oh, no, he's never had his act filmed. Never had a special, purposely never did because... Never special because he figured... You I come, burn you, all that material. You pay and come and see me. Right. And I've worked, you know, I, I, I have to tell you that I, I actually admire... Stand-up is such a bizarre... Art form, yeah. ...skill, and, and, and I've known... It's weird because I've known, you know, I've known everybody from Groucho, you know, up, down, and Jer I've worked with Jerry Lewis and Bob Hope and uh, and Don Rickles and so many of these. Steve Henny Martin. Youngman. Henny Youngman. Well, Steve Martin is not, Steve Martin's one of the newer ones, but it's like, and Eddie Murphy and, you know, and on and on. But it's. Of it's that. Uh, of the, uh, George Burns is the one. George Burns, you know, told me, and I know you know it, but told me the, the greatest joke I ever heard in my life. And it was. Be also because it was George Burns. He was 92 or something. When he told you? Well, you know this joke. He's like, okay, you are the young neophyte stand-up, and I am the aged and greatly respected and beloved vaudevillian. And you approach me and you say, when I point at you, okay, you say, to what do you owe your great success? Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Timing! He's the first one to tell you that. I never heard, no, George Burns told it to me. And there's just something in these guys. I mean, Henny Youngman, as I worked with Henny twice, and the older I get, and... By the, the way, your timing was off a little bit I know, on I'm the sorry. timing joke. But the funnier he is, <laughs> actually, by the way, <laughs> that, see, if I, if I had that on film, I could fix it for you. No, but the, uh, the older I get, the funnier Henny Youngman is. Yeah. I mean, the jokes Henny Youngman said when I was 12, you know, I just think, what? You know, but now I think, if a man is alone in the forest, no, I'm fucked it up. Okay? <laughs> he says, if a husband is alone in the forest, is he still wrong? <laughs> you know, it's like, you... I, you can't appreciate that at 12. No, I don't know. You know, take my wife. All that stuff, and Henny Youngman once, <laughs> we saw the set, I look down, he's got a, a blue sock and a red sock. Henny, you've got a blue sock and a red sock. He says, I know, I got a pair just like them at home. <laughs> and you realize... He, he dressed. To just for that joke. Yeah, so someone would ask, you know, it's just a whole different kind of, yeah. it's a different thing, and, and, and stand-up is such a peculiar skill. And to watch people do it, I mean, and they're still, I mean, with all the clubs and stuff, if you can, I always urge people, I always think, I was shooting a TV show, uh, you know that show Psych? Sure. It's, it's James Roday. And yeah. Those guys do, like, very nice guys. James and Maggie were here. Uh, Maggie's wonderful. Yeah. You know, she's so good, by the way. Anyway, but I directed like three or four of them or something. And I just really like those. It's, a, it's, a, it's fun. Um, they pay for shit, I'll tell you that. But, <laughs> but it's fun. And so we were in Vancouver, and the Smothers Brothers. I love it when people who have $14 less than God complain about not getting nah. paid. <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> So yeah, the Smothers brothers. brothers were yes. coming to one of those casinos yeah, oh. in Vancouver. And I said... We gotta go. First of all, I said, no, I've gotta film them for Mr. Warp. So, oh. so I had to get a local camera, because I was making this thing. So I got, this is how you piecemeal these interviews. Oh, yeah, Any yeah. chance you got. Any chance I got. So I, got a, I, I rented a camera, and I went and shot the interview, and then I bought tickets for, the, for like Maggie, for all... And they were all going, really? Go see Smothers Brothers? And I said, you have to see them. And you know, what? they killed. They're so oh, good. Yeah. And I think most people don't realize they think the Smothers, even, even the ones who know them, right. go, well, they're, you know, you don't want to. No, go see them. They're, yeah. they're just great. Or yeah. Bob Newhart. Bob yeah. still does gigs, mostly. He's so good. Ridiculous. Yeah. Or, or Bill Cosby. Yeah. I mean, these guys, they're so good. And it, it's just amazing. And it's just such an unusual skill. Mm. It's really stand-up, and what's fascinating, if you look at films, Dustin Hoffman's a brilliant actor. I think he's a great actor. And if you look at Lenny, yeah. off stage, he's dazzling. On stage, he's not very good. No. Same thing with Tom Hanks in Punchline. Great actor. Could not do stand-up. Right. It's a different timing. It's a, it's a different, different rhythm. It's a different skill. Yeah. It's just a, a different thing. And, you know, I, uh, 
my uncle, I grew up in L.A., and my great uncle, uh, uh, Judge Ben Landis, was one of the, a member of Hillcrest Country Club. Oh, boy. And once or twice a year, when I was a kid, a little kid, I got to go to the famous Sunday brunch at Hillcrest. No. Which used to be, brunch. I must say, extraordinary. It used to be, not so much anymore, but it used to be extraordinary. As, uh, as uh, Harpo said, this brunch has killed more Jews than Hitler. But, it, uh, <laughs> but this, it was really... I seem to be laughing. It was an amazing, amazing thing you never saw. But there was a table when you went in, and at the table, I was, you know, nine, but at the table were uh, Georgie Jessel and Groucho and either Harpo or Chico Marx, Chico Marx, there, uh, Jack Benny, George Burns, you know, now, or, you know, when I finally was a professional, you'd see George Burns, you know, in the card room or something. But just to see those guys, Mind all, boggling. and they were so fucking funny and just upping one another. Yeah. Just, you know, upping one another. And also they would do stuff like someone would say something killing and they'd go. Steve Martin told me it was two fingers on the table. That's what you got. You got like this. When yeah. you killed. You got that. That was. They never laughed at each other. Well, sometimes they did. Well, they couldn't help it. Sometimes, but ultimately, the great acknowledgement was Jack Benny was was genuinely. He found George Burns. George Burns just destroyed him, and George would just just destroy him. And you, Jack Benny would be like crying, helpless. George Burns would just would level him. Yeah. And doing weird stuff too. You know, you can eat that. You know, just <laughs> weird stuff. And Jack Benny would just be crying. But it's like, and then I've seen, you know, it's the beginning of Mr. Warmth is something that my, my proudest thing in that show. Please they, check out this documentary, anyone within near show. Well, you get it, it's Mr. Warmth, but it's, it's out there on Amazon or whatever. But um, in the opening, when Tony O is, is walking him to the stage, mm. you know, by the way, that hotel, they blew it up. I went to, that's the last showroom. I actually shot the last, I never realized when I was doing it, right. I was shooting the Las Vegas showroom. Now they're all like theaters. But I... Tony, his uh, Tony O is major his, domo. His for entourage, 45, an 50 years, 65. Mm, not years. that long. No? He, he was Sinatra's guy. Oh, okay. And uh, for many years. In fact, I think I finally convinced him to write a book oh, about God. Sinatra. Because boy, nice. the stories. But the. Uh, no, when you see Tony walking Don from the um, his dressing room to the stage, backstage. He's an, you see an old man. Yeah. I mean, he's 82. The moment he came off it. the stage. And you see, him, you see an old man, and he goes and he waits in the wings, and then he hits the stage and just, boom! And he's just awesome. And, and it's just an extraordinary thing to say. It's amazing. We, uh, we of the elk call it the cure-all also. You could be suffering any illness, and you walk on stage, and you are without illness in an instant. It, it's something with the adrenaline or whatever, endorphins, whatever There's it is. There's no business like But show. Specific, specifically being on stage as a stand-up, uh, whatever. There's, a, there's also there's a, a thing that I really admire, having worked with too many performers, but, you know, musicians, comedians, actors, everything, is this professionalism mm. that is, is not what it was. There, there's, there's actors that I call old Hollywood, but by that I meant any actor who made his living in television or movies before 1970. <laughs> I call old Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, of course. But what's interesting is those guys, they show up on time, they know all their words, they never trip on a cable. Nope. They, it, you know, if they're blocked, they clear the lens. And there's no, the only training like that left is really, I guess television is like if you get a sitcom or something. There's no real training left. I think one of the reasons why Hollywood was Hollywood was because they, if you look at a picture like The Wizard of Oz, the entire cast is vaudeville. Right. You had guys, the Marx Brothers, Buster Keaton, you know, W.C. Fields, they had been on stage for like 30 years That's before right. they made a movie. The Three Stooges, my you God. Know, all those guys. Yeah. And even, you know, Michael Jackson, you look at the Jackson Five, those guys were doing, you know, five shows a day in the lounge in Vegas. For when 15 he was eight years. years old. Yeah, easily for 15 years or more before he became a solo Oh, yeah, mega and, and it, it, it's... Uh, it's just something. That it's an amazing. It's such a pleasure to work with. I did it. This is going to sound really silly, but I direct. I used to produce a TV show called Dream On. You certainly and did. We'd, and we talk about changing the way things are done. <laughs> By the way, no, seriously. Well, that was anyway. We we the, we did this show at, for very little money, and we because we used those clips, we would try to get often the performers who were in the clips to come and 
play Oh, nice, things. yeah. So we had, we had this wonderful thing with Ricardo Montalban and Yvonne De Carlo. Oh, yeah. As, as elderly and young and gorgeous. It was very funny to cut this fight, intercut it. Anyway, so I'm shooting this scene with David Bowie and Ava Gabor. <laughs> How many people get to say that? <laughs> one, of my, one of the highlights of my existence. But um, So I'm shooting, so to Ava Gabor, I just remember this because it just made such an impression on me, which was we're shooting in the valley, it's 160 degrees, and you know, the back, you know, in someone's pool. And Ava Gabor is coming to do her day's work. Mm -hmm. So, and they're paid scale plus 10. Right? Sure. So, Ms. Gabor arrives, and she was with her makeup person, her hairdresser, her own wardrobe person, her publicist. <laughs> you know, she came like seven people. Are you sure? Yeah. And she shows up, but what's great is in the parking lot, she says to the PA, she says, could you please introduce me to the first assistant director? Oh. Of course, he takes it, and she's not a young woman, takes it at the first. Uh, Ms. Gabor wants to meet you. He said, oh, listen, she said, I just want you, please. I need at least 20 minutes. Just be sure to give me 20 minutes. Of course, Ms. Gabor. And he says, thank you. And would you please introduce me to the cameraman? Of course. Takes her over to Mac. I'm watching this. <laughs> Takes her over to Mac. The, the, You're wondering when your turn is? Well, sure. <laughs> to Mac. To, but also, I was just really to, the, to the, D, the DP. And she said, hello, I'm Ava Gabor. She goes, listen. Told him the lenses, the angle, what gauze to use. All, by the way, completely correct. And he listened, and she said, I'm not young. And he said, oh, Ms. Gabor, you're so beautiful. She said, just please, would you please, you know. He goes, of course. But by the time she got to me, the entire crew would kill for her. Yes, yes. And it was she was so delicious. I mean, she also, by the way, Ava Gabor is very underrated. Green Acres, she's great. Anyway, but she was great. Yeah. But it was just a level of respect for the crew and professionalism. True etiquette, true professionalism. Just fabulous, and you don't... Of an era that's bygone many decades. Uh, it's just that you, you still have lovely people, but there's a lot of people who just become monster stars. Yeah, and, and there was just a certain training and appreciation and respect for the world with which they in which they worked. I mean, honestly, that, yeah, to me... Yeah, and, and they also weren't nuts. Right. I mean, I have dealt with... <laughs> well... I have worked with, as you have... Performers who are out of their fucking minds, you know, yeah. and you're, you're, you're dancing around, but but still, don't you think most of that insanity, if not in every case, comes from abject insecurity? Uh, sometimes, not always, no. Right. Sometimes, yes. Right. The biggest stars always the the ones who also end up being uh, bizarrely a pain in the ass, which aren't many, but those that are there, there aren't that many. I mean, many. And it also, seems driven by insecurity. I, well. Which is, you know, flies in the face of the success. I, I also have to say that I have worked, I have lived through with uh, John Belushi, Michael Jackson, a number of people. I worked with Paul McCartney and David Bowie and and all the great Aretha Franklin, you know, James Brown. There's a certain level of success that that actors live through, and it quite honestly, and and singers, and it's very difficult to remain sane. Sure. In those circumstances, and I've seen it, and I, I have watched it, and I've seen it. Yeah, no, I've pointed out to people if you're you're questioning why an actor would act like a child. Well, let me run down a few things for you. They dress you like a child. They feed you. They give you an allowance. You can raise your little paw at any time during the day, and someone will bring you basically whatever the you best, want. I always felt the best job in the world was actor on location. Oh, God. Especially if it was a nice location. I don't know about Las Vegas for how many weeks? <laughs> 20 weeks was too much. But, yeah, you're right. Barry Levinson's movie Avalon was the first location I worked on. I actually, at such a neophyte, went in the production office because I had to mail a letter and said, could I get a stamp? Is that possible? And they just laughed at me. Possible? We can have the mayor killed. <laughs> <laughs> when we were shooting Animal I remember this. this when we were shooting Animal House in Eugene. The entire time of shooting, it rained. Yeah. And last day of <sighs> shooting, last shot of, was the parade <sighs> in, in Cottage Grove. Cottage Grove, I was so jazzed. That's where Buster Keaton shot the general. Oh. So I was very excited. To sure. Um, but it started snowing. You can see it in two shots, the snow. In any case. I did see it. I did see the snow. No, but I just you just flashed this oh. memory for me because there's no explanation. No. There's no connection to any reality. Okay, so. Anyway. Now you just digitally erase it. But anyway, so we're shooting, and it's it was cold. In fact, it rained every... It didn't not rain. Every shot has rain. And what people don't know is if you don't light rain, you don't see rain, unless it's a monsoon. So 
the dailies were funny because you'd see the crew, you know, all bundled up and everyone with umbrellas and things like this. And then they do the slate and everyone would run, run out and the actors would just cut and everyone would run back. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, so anyway, but I look over and John Belushi's standing in shorts and, you know, his sweatshirt just standing there in the pouring rain. I looked down and said, John, why aren't you wearing a coat? And he went, you're right. Usually someone does that for me. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, absolutely. If there's any wonder, if you don't have your shit wired correctly, or you weren't raised properly with manners and respect for others, before you reach any sort of success as an actor, you are fucked if you want to hold on to sanity. It's not going to happen. Well, also, there is something that, to, I mean, I have watched people where, especially when you're very young, people who become very big when they're older tend to deal with it better. Sure. But when you're really young and you become a superstar, 19, 20, it's crazy. You are the goose that laid the golden egg and people start telling you things that aren't necessarily true plus you don't necessarily want to hear things that are true and I know I've watched it I know guys who you know couldn't get arrested suddenly can sleep with anyone they want mm. and if they show up late nobody says anything and if they go to a t restaurant they'll get a table I mean celebrity does have amazing perks but it's it, it's dangerous I've watched it and what happens it's the Elvis you know the Memphis Mafia syndrome when you're a kid and you become a big star, who do you trust? Well, you gotta trust your, your buddies or your family, but as soon as your family or your buddies become your employees, the relationship changes. And Chefs, you become. You become, and, and then the truth changes and what you wanna hear that. that I've, I've only seen a few of those entourage shows, but I think that's what it's about, although it's not very truthful, but that's what it's about, you know, yeah. that kind of, it's a strange, and what also I've seen a lot, and that's weird, is how much people hate it. I mean, guys you knew in high school think you owe them something. Right. Well, you won't, you know, you are my friend, so I give me a job or I want some money or, you know, or amazing, relatives come out of the woodwork. And I have, I've seen amazing things happen to people. It's yeah. It's strange. Well, sometimes they're able to employ those friends and make it part of their team. And sometimes it's great. Yeah. No, sometimes it works. Not usually. Not usually, no. Uh, speaking of not usually, I think we may now have your longest, most in-depth interview. Can you believe when I tell you we've been at this table two hours and 42 minutes? Really? If you go six more minutes, if you go six more minutes you've got the record. How is that possible? We went over three hours. <laughs> no, but that wasn't all me. Well, no, we did talk for seven minutes before we, we went to you. You're right. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry nothing! This is a dream for us! Are you kidding? That's the opposite reaction I was Everyone hoping for. Everyone in the chat room says this is the, one of, the greatest Oh, they're interview. loving it. Yeah. No. So you mean the people out there? No, the people chat room. Are Thousands of people in the chat room. Because the hookah out there is We have people watching from all over. Oh, My no. good friends How many in Australia people are watching. watching this now? No, we have, we have literally, literally anywhere from 500 to 50,000 on any given Sunday. I'm not kidding. Any given Sunday. Right? Should be the name of three movies. But the truth is they come and they go throughout the room so the number of the actual people there is in constant flux or sometimes seems to change uh, uh, be the same but uh, you know I really do apologize I'm sorry that's too long I don't think you understand how happy we are I, you can feel bad for yourself but don't feel bad for us my god this is this is bragging rights from I will dine off this for years are you kidding now sir I have one last uh, tweet five okay, for you, you can ask me that then I have to tell you a joke Team okay five. good you, you gonna tell me the joke? No, first. Joke. Okay. This from uh, at JWJ170104. Did he serve time in Sing Sing? What's the number? Holocaust survivor. Okay, uh, nice. Nice to bring it from funny <laughs> down to pain. Jake or Elwood? Oh, both. <laughs> Mandy or Bab? Babs. Chevy or Danny? Oh, come on. Danny. Please. <laughs> Axel or Billy Ray? Both. Palace coming to America, frat house, animal house. Mm. Mm. In terms of sets. Well, one was a real location and the other was a set. Yes. At Paramount. Yes. So. Mm. Cannot thank you enough. Honest to goodness. Thank you. I really am mortified. And thank you for this. We thank you very much for that. Blues um, Brothers, too, DVD. That's, uh, they both came out at the same time. It's yeah. a celebration of you, really. Is what well, I think it's John Belushi. All brother. right, fine. Um, let's see. Okay, good. Uh, now, at this point in, in... Oh, wait a minute. Yes, the joke. You have wait, a joke Wait, before first. the joke, no, wait, shit. 
Uh, two things. One is Burke and Hare, the picture I just made with uh, Simon Pegg, Andy Serkis, um, Tom Wilkinson, Tim Curry, Christopher Lee, Isla Fisher, has a great cast. I just made it last year in London, and it... It, it was, had it released there, but not here. It's, it's coming out here? It's been released all over the world. In the United States, IFC, it's right now. You can get it. Uh, this is depressing. Video on demand on Sundance. That's not depressing. That's not depressing at all for a great generation, I promise Oh, really? You. Yes. Well, as a filmmaker, it kills me. And it opens... How about you reach more homes? It, I don't want to reach homes. I want to see it big with a lot of... A movie is better... Big with lots of people watching it. I agree with you 100. You know. percent let's, anyway, let's rent a theater. But, and but, but it's called Burke and Hare, and it opens September 9th in Manhattan in Los Angeles theatrically. Oh. But right now you can see it Sundance Video on Demand, and it's it's got based on a true story about two about Burke and Hare about two lovable sociopaths. Sort of. Mm-hmm. It's a, ironically it's the most it's it's a black comedy. It's a but it, ironically it's the most accurate of all the historically accurate of all the versions. Now if we, if you give us this joke that you just promised now seconds I'm, ago, now I'm regretting that. No, no. Yes. Uh, is that in lieu of is that in lieu of the Larry King game or is that going to be the Larry King game? What is the Larry King game? All right, I really really well, explain I want to know what it is before. Well. We we ask all the guests at the end of the show, and I do mean 120. I can't. 120 imitate. before you. I want a bad Larry King. I don't want to go. That I could do. Yeah, and then give us that little moment of Larry, a uh, little bumper before he goes. No, to no, the, Larry before King. Before he goes to the phones. What? Wait a minute. I I uh, I was in the day Michael Jackson passed. Yes. I was on my way to London uh, to do this movie, and then Burke and Hare, and they said, "Please talk to Larry." About and La this. yeah, Larry King got you know in touch with me. And he had Rickles call me. I mean, sure. he's like you know. John, we gotta have you on the show. And I'm like, Jesus Christ! And you know, have you ever done that satellite thing? I mean, I'm in London, they're in L.A., and, and you're talking into a and, teleprompter. Well, Larry had uh, uh, Tito Brando, who is uh, was very close to Michael and a, an employee and friend of Michael, um, and <laughs> and had the name Brando for a reason. Yes, and uh, but Lou Ferrigno, who was Michael's trainer, was uh, there before me. And this is this is Larry King's story. So I'm in London, sitting in this room at like three or four in the morning, sure. the thing in my ear, and a monitor. And Larry's in L.A. with Lou Ferrigno and Tito Brando. And uh, Larry says, uh, and there's a delay. It's really odd. It's a very strange thing. Anyway, he says, well, I'm here with uh, Tito Brando and Lou Ferragamo. <laughs> Ferrigno. <laughs> what? <laughs> Ferrigno. <laughs> That's what I said, Ferragamo. I'm here with Lou Ferragamo and uh, Miko Brando. It is Miko, by the way. It's not Tito. It's Miko Brando. Right, it's me right. fucking up. It's Miko, who's a very nice guy. And uh, in uh, London. London, I've got uh, Michael Jackson. No! And I said, Larry, no, you have John Landis and Miko Brando and Lou Ferrigno. And he goes, what? Oh, my God. And I wow. said, John Landis. I know, John, how are you? I said, I'm fine, Larry. How are you? I'm here with Lou Ferragamo. <laughs> and Lou Ferrigno's going, Ferrigno. <laughs> and like, I'm in London. Poor Michael is dead, you know, a week. This is a serious situation. And I'm like trying not to laugh. Because, and oh, poor this is... Lou Ferrigno's getting more upset by the minute. Miko Brando's there. And that's what it was. He kept going, I'm here with Tito Brando. Miko. What? Oh my God. And he kept calling me Michael in London. <laughs> Tell, no, Larry, I'm John. Yes, John. I know. Like going, why is he telling me this? Wow. And I'm thinking like, oh, my God. But, he, but what was terrible is finally he said, all right, well, enough of Mr. Uh, Ferragamo. Uh, let's stay with Tito and John. Uh, John Jackson in London <laughs> and Tito Landis in Los Angeles. Oh my Christ! Thank you, uh, Lou Ferragamo. You know. And with that beautiful Larry King story, That's we have story. beaten the record laid by Damon Lindelof. We now have a new possible? record for the show. Wait, who, whose record did I beat? Damon Lindelof, the wonderful writer of the Lost TV show and the new Cowboys and Aliens, and mm. a wonderful, uh, a, a gr tremendous interview. It has, I assure you, sir, been a tremendous honor and pleasure to have you here. Honest to goodness. Good. Then you have to... I also have a book coming out in October. Yeah, wait. I'll, I'll, I've got it here. Uh, I love this, and I want to hear more about it, actually. Uh, uh, 10,000... Wait, 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 wait. 
Oh, son of a bitch. Why don't you just tell us? It's called Monsters in the Movies. 100, 100 years, years of Movie Nightmares. Cinematic Nightmares. Oh. From uh, DK Publishing. When does it come out? October. It's oh. a very cool book. Over a thousand photographs. I, I promise you, if you uh, if somehow send us a copy. We'll hope. I will, I will get I them will to do send this. a copy. I will do this. Hold it up in front of a guest's face. Yeah, we'll do yes. this. No matter who I'm talking to, I will hold this up in front of their face and talk about it ad nauseum. Honestly. Ad nauseum? Ad nauseum. Great. Yeah. <laughs> who could ask for more? Uh, thank you very much. Thank I'll you. And I was quite serious when I said I'm a fan. I mean, it's... And you do a brilliant Alan Arkin, which is, by the way, annoying for you, but for those of us... <laughs> Who are Alan Arkin fans, it's pretty special. All right, then I'll tell you what. It's Alan, okay when you have to live with it. Yeah, exactly. It's okay it's around, when you get in if it's in snippets. the kitchen, it's a problem. Yeah. Most um, snippets is fine. I will carry a spear for you anytime, sir. Please keep that in mind. If I get a job. Actually, <laughs> I should say that too. I'm leaving for London in a week to make another movie even more obscure than Burke and Hare. How's my part in that? Uh, well, it's, it's uh, do you know Restoration Comedy? Mm hmm. It's Sheridan's um, The Rivals. Mm hmm. And it takes place in Bath and London in 1775. You'd have to wear a wig. <laughs> Not a problem. I wear a hat every week. Uh, <laughs> with Joe Fiennes and Albert Finney and a lot of good English actors. I'm telling you, I'll be there with a spear. Just let me know. There are no spears, but we'll just pan by, you know. You must know the expression. there with a spear. No, I know, I Please. know. Please. Of all things, you must know that. <laughs> well, that's an opera, I thought. Uh, yes. It certainly originated in opera. So the joke? The joke that you were going to tell is, us? I just learned this joke from my dentist, and a man has serious impacted wisdom teeth. It's a true story. And a man had serious impacted wisdom teeth and goes to my, my dentist. He said, you must have these out immediately. They're obsessing. It's serious. You can get septic poisoning. And they got him to an oral surgeon. The guy's in agony. The oral surgeon took out a hypodermic, and the man says, no needles. He said, well, I want to inject you with an No needles. Okay, well, we'll use gas. No gas. All right, here, and he gave him this blue pill. The guy says, what's this? He says, Viagra. Why? He says, because you're going to have to hold on to something. <laughs> <laughs> My dentist joke. Got, and the dentist's name? Let's give him credit. Dr. Hirsch. Dr. Hirsch, thank you for a <laughs> tremendous joke. <laughs> and thank you, sir. With or without you. your dentist. Thank you very much. Uh, tremendous honor. Sit there uncomfortably for uh, 72 more mm -hmm. seconds while I wrap things up here for the audience at home uh, and around the world. Uh, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, the wonderful crew, Dr. Chen here in, in the studio, Sam and Jamie, of course, we heard from, Emily Goodwin, Mike Rotman, Josh Negrin, uh, Samantha Ward, and Jason McIntyre outside these hallowed walls, and our intern, Adam. Welcome. And um, next week... We have the great radio icon, Phil Hendry, and then followed by Sugar Ray Leonard. Check the calendar to see the upcoming uh, guests that we have, which ones you might want to tune in for. This, that's my agent. Leave him alone. Or Jeff Goldblum. Yes. Um, <laughs> or David Edison. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to say there was a strike, and there'll be no uh, crew gag this week, because I don't see anything on the monitor letting me know there is. So we'll just say until next time, and as always, get out of my face. Thank you.